I know, I know. <laughs> that that particular decision I don't understand, but I'm, I'm sure yeah. you'll tell me. Um, all I'll say is it worked, actually. Welcome to another episode of the HMG Podcast. Uh, I'm here as Daniel, and I've got with me Gorchen. Hi, everyone. Uh, and today we're actually going to be briefly recapping uh, Southern Thrust. Uh, there's another episode that's going to be picking up some information where Gorchen had a chat with uh, Gilly, who is the TO for that particular one. Um, but we thought we'd just jump on. We both attended, uh, and we thought we'd just jump on because we faced each other as well. And so um, it's a good <laughs> it's a good conversation for us to have. And we'll run through what the event looked like, uh, our different pieces within it, uh, our different formatting and things like that. Uh, so, so Gorchin, what what do you what do you think? So, so we did a different format this time. Yeah, yeah. Gilly ran a, a a new format than what we normally do. So I think probably the the first core of the format that's worth mentioning is that it was Swiss pairings all the way through. Uh, so it didn't do Allied or Axis. And uh, first round he baked in a couple of pairings that he thought would be really good. I think he baked in some uh, basically people who'd never played each other or would not normally get an opportunity to play each other. So. Uh, for, for those of you who are familiar with geography, this was an event down in Albany. For those of you who aren't super familiar with geography, like you, Dan, that was a four or five hour drive from WA's capital city. And so yeah. those guys, there's a small group of them who come up for every event. Sometimes it's sometimes it's most of them, about you know, five or six will make it up. But, but usually there's a core of three or four that make it uh, every event. And so this time around, they, they hosted an event uh, with 18 plays filled up uh and and no no shows actually which is which is a bit of a miracle especially in this day and age uh, oh it was awesome yeah and and so that was that was interesting the army list uh restrictions i guess if you could call them restrictions uh was not very restricted <laughs> so i think the only limitation was 888 points uh there was not an order dice cap uh, oh and no special characters um, and, it, and it had to be a single platoon. And it had to be a single pl platoon, right. Theater selectors were in, armored platoons were in, uh, which, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, yeah, we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, and a couple of other things that, that, that Gilly did side mission-wise, you know, here in WA, we sort of flirt with, with side missions or side objectives. Uh, I went real big for my upcoming event, and Gilly took a much more reasonable approach. He... He gave the VPs out based on list building. So you got one VP yeah. if you brought a first lieutenant. You got one VP if your entire list was the same experience level all the way through. And you got another VP... Uh, if you took at least one squad that was full strength. Thank you. Yeah, at least yeah. one squad that was full strength. And for it to count as full strength, it's the full strength core rule uh sorry in the yeah. main rule book so that is has to be a minimum of 10 models and it has to be the max size of that squad can be as well yeah. so you couldn't take a squad of eight engineers and claim the vp for example yeah. uh and uh so i just he also very excitingly and i think this is something um i think the community should get behind as a whole every now and again um we get some players will do list write-ups leading up to events yeah. gilly published all of the lists um, he he actually removed the names, but it was it was pretty quick to identify who was taking what. The, yeah, <laughs> there was a few giveaways. <laughs> yeah, there was a few giveaways. Uh, but eighty eight, sorry, eighty five percent of players took a max size squad. Seventy five percent took first LT, and only half took single veterancy lists. Uh, out of the full eighteen players, uh, eight of them got all three uh, VPs in list building. So that's actually about 40%, a little less than half. Yeah. So basically it came down to really by the looks of a single veterancy list was kind of the deal breaker for, yeah. for the majority of the people, which is no surprise really. Yeah. I it, think. Out of those three, I think, and you're right. I think innately that becomes the, the differential. If someone decides, okay, I'm going to put choosing either all regs or all veterans or all inexperienced, they, that all comes with pros and cons. Yeah. Um, and so, 
um, to only see approximately half the field decide to make a choice, uh, or sorry, just over half the field make a choice against that to go, no, I want a bit more flexibility in what I take. That is probably about expected. Um, we'll get into what I did later. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that was, again, that was, that there was no surprise. I figured in terms of, again, deal breakers, I felt like that's the one where most people in our community would have gone, no, I need to min max a few selected, a few selections in my platoon. And I actually, I, I didn't agree with that deduction. I went for all three VPs just because uh, what I had in my list, I didn't feel like I could take an extra VP back by changing a veterancy, which is really the question you're asking yourself. By making my multiple rocket launcher inexperienced, am I getting enough points to do something else? Or if you do it with a couple of your units, right? At which point do you accumulate enough points to do something a little bit extra? Especially if you're talking an open dice list, that kind of yeah. is an, it's an unsolvable question, right? Because is you know if you're talking about taking a, a cheapest order dice you can get i think for the us it's a 17 point uh cheap transport uh in experience and like it's super easy to find 17 points by just playing with veterancy in a few units but like what is that extra jeep getting you and especially yeah, what is it doing yeah yeah and is it getting you another victory point somewhere else i think uh yeah so i went with a kind of a very funny theater selector um, I think a lot of people walked away from it. Um, and just like I tend to do, I like to talk about conventional wisdom and why it's conventional, why it's really good. And then I just try to break it like I did with the MMGs. Uh, and so we talk about how medium tanks are overcosted and they're really hard to get your points back and all that sort of stuff. And I, I still stand by all of those statements, but I took two. Uh, I took <laughs> the bloody Gulch selector, which is... There, there's a bunch of different caveats. You can basically only take regular infantry squads or paratrooper infantry squads. All of your support options, so flamethrowers, bazookas, artillery, can either be parachute infantry or armored infantry. I think the selector actually just uses regular infantry. It doesn't use the newer fancy armored infantry. The, the flip side of that, the limitations of the selector being that all of your paratrooper choices had to be veteran. And all of your armored, second armored options had to be regular, which meant you could either get veteran infantry squads as paratroopers or regular infantry squads as uh, regulars, just just your baseline yeah. US infantry squad. The shamans were had to be regular, though, which meant you couldn't use gyro stabilizers. Uh, but, yeah, I hadn't picked that up, actually. Yeah, but you can take uh, one Sherman for every armored infantry squad up to a, to a maximum of three Shermans. Now, at 888 points, what that meant was I got two squads of 12 infantry with two BARs, two squads of six with one BAR, and one first lieutenant. Now, the reason I, you know, looking back on it, could I have gone three squads of eight and a squad of 12? Yeah, um, I don't think it would have, having... It would have changed the way I played a little bit, uh, but I kind of like, there was no way I was going to go three squads of 12. I think it's just, yeah. it's just too much of a pin magnet, each one in, in particular. And, and my infantry squads were pin magnets. Uh, the Shermans <laughs> that I took were just regular. I didn't bother with a pintle, didn't cancel out thin sides. I, uh, and I got the, the base M4. So thin sides easily catches fire. Um, so it did knock off the points a little bit. I think they came in at under 200 apiece, but not not significantly. I think it's 10 points for for both of yeah, the rules. So it's 20 points it's, all up per show. It's an extra man with a rifle, essentially. Yeah, and, and I also had um, a light howitzer, uh, which I took. So I took all of them as second armored. Now, the, the other part of the selector that I did... I couldn't avoid basically the theater selector. Obviously it has pros and it has cons. The other one I couldn't avoid was that all of your Shermans or basically you had a small list of armored vehicles to choose from. All of them had to start off the board. So if it was a first wave game, you're fine. They could come on as first wave. If it had a deployment phase, they had to go into reserve. Um, yeah. And, and that, and I looked at the list and looked at the missions that we were playing. Two of them were first wave and two of them had mandatory reserves. Oh, sorry. One of them had mandatory reserves. The other one had optional reserves. And I kind of went, yes. yeah. you know what? 
like if this is if this is the limitation that i've got most players are going to face those same limitations for three out of four rounds and i'm yeah. kind of okay with that and yeah. also like i only had eight dice at 888 points that's not unreasonable but i also know that it's quite low like even when mm. when we play 1250 games i will kind of push 12 14 dice with cheap cheap select cheap selections so i'm like i actually don't mind them being in reserve because it forces my opponent to maybe not in the in the one game where we both have reserves but i'd be a bit surprised if this was the case it forces my opponents to place their anti tank assets and again yes. I took a gamble here. I'm like, 888 points. Everybody knows that medium tanks are overcosted. No one's going to take a medium anti-tank gun. No one's going to take a medium tank. I'm going to, I might see some Panzerfaust. I might see some anti-tank rifles. Probably going to see some, um, what are the Japanese guys called? Who the Japanese um, lunge miners. Lunge miners, guys. thank you. Yeah. You, you know, and I'm sitting there going, for you to take those things, you have to expect big heavy armor that's not open topped. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to gamble it. I don't think anybody's going to expect two medium tanks. Uh, and and I think that gamble was correct. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree. From from the other lists that I saw, obviously, they were all released. Um, some of us were packing um, anti-tank, but, but really it was for soft skins or armed carriers to, yeah. to really take those out. I, I think I saw um, a bunch of anti-tank rifles, you know, a good yeah. mattering of howitzers. No surprise there. Um, I think yep. most lists had a howitzer. Uh, not too many mortars, though. I didn't see too many. No, no, there weren't many mortars. Um, uh, or they were like what I like. I took a light mortar, yeah, and definitely. so it was that flexibility yeah. element of the move and fire, um, but shorter range. Yeah. But um, no, I think you're right. I think taking the two tanks, um, the two medium tanks, was a good uh, gamble. Um, and I think, especially given the points limit, I think it was a good gamble. I yeah. don't think many people were expecting to see at 888 points two tanks um two sizably you know they're quite reliable tanks yeah um, sorry i don't yeah. know i don't know if we actually mentioned that the event was called southern thrust if we, oh, yeah. we didn't mention sorry. it that's what the event is that. called <laughs> it'll be in the title of the description it'll be everywhere it'll be southern thrust but yeah what what list did you take there so i ended up going back to my soviets um purely because my bulgarians um like super fun wanted to play with them at the last event that i didn't get to unfortunately yeah. um and but they are built as a balanced list and because Boom. because i saw well because i saw what restrictions were potentially not in play yeah <laughs> um, for this event i i really thought and i went look i would take the bulgarians and i would have an absolute ball like it'd be it'd be really fantastic but when i looked at and i went actually there's there's a stack of missions here where the bulgarian rule national rule where i would stop people from not flanking uh and putting stuff in forward deployment that could be quite useful yeah um but then i looked at i, I just simply looked at what options i had physically built painted and ready uh because i had other stuff on my paint queue so I, I didn't exactly have time to go and create a bunch of new stuff and i went <laughs> i like how we took the exact opposite approach i went and <laughs> yeah. bought a sherman and speed painted it <laughs> <laughs> and i'm just like too busy <laughs> um uh, in hindsight, that means that I did get actually a whole bunch of other hobby done, so that was great. But um, winning the the yeah the the reality was I was like I I don't think there's enough teeth in it to make it um, genuinely what I think I'd need to, to yeah. play. So, so I went back to my, back to my Soviets, uh, the two Soviet forces that I've got, and I went well, well. I mean, let's see what options I've got, mm. and the Soviets have arguably I think the best selection of units and flexibility and options of things that you can do it's like it definitely is like on, the on the allied side uh on the allied side yeah, yeah for the, sure. the, they did. they might get eked out a little by the germans in a few slots but but i think if even even if you if you put them tit for tat and i'd i'd wager the soviets without having the army books in front of me i'd wager that the soviets yeah, they're, they're pretty they're pretty closely matched and so largely then i started looking at you know okay do i want to do a silo heights list which mm -hmm, is a very mm -hmm. typical competitive dual double tank slot um you know uh, has some very very good potential in it uh and i then i looked at the objectives and i went hmm. i still want to go and play something fun like i, I, I don't want to go something because I, I actually didn't 
want to win the event. Is that that sounds like a bit silly, but I wanted to go and You're support lying, yeah. John Gill a little bit. Um, <laughs> I wanted to go and I wanted to be a gatekeeper list. That's actually right, what I designed okay. my yeah, list. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I didn't necessarily care about winning, but I wanted whoever was going to win to have to fight hard in against my list to get anywhere. So so for those um, not familiar with, with other circles, what is a what's a gatekeeping list? Talk us through that, what that means and and, and why they're called that. Yeah, so the the gatekeeper list that I that I'm or, or the the concept that I'm referring to is that uh, if you want to be able to play in and 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 get some sort of a podium finish, let's say on on the top, because we we're running Swiss yeah. pairing, so it was going to rank on order of dice and battle order and things like that. Uh, I wanted to position myself that if anyone wanted to be on that top set of tables, uh, and there was only eighteen players, there was a good chance that in the first two rounds they were going to have to fight me. Yeah. because I wasn't included in any grudge matches. And okay. so typically <laughs> grudge matches don't fall through yeah, yeah. On, um, uh, on on the scoring. Uh, and so I was like, okay, so if for anyone that did not grudge match, therefore they're wanting to fight, you could fight me in round one, you could fight me in round two, or you could be stuck with me in round three. Yeah. Uh, and I went, what is something that I can take that is obnoxious but isn't actually... Um, insurmountable like yeah. like it's yeah. I, I was i didn't want to take maori gurkhas for example no offense to the guy that did take some of the maori gurkha units um i didn't want to take bamboo spearmen i didn't want yeah. to take any yeah. of those classic archetypes i ended up taking an archetype anyway but um, well th this is the thing about like sort of the gatekeeper concept at large uh so it's it's lists that perform well in the meta that you would yeah. expect to see at top tables or approaching top tables. Yeah. So the idea being that if you're going to an event and uh, you, you want to get through the gate, uh, that is to get to the podium or near the top, the gatekeeper yeah. lists are things that you would typically expect to see. And as we talked about in sort of uh, all like gloves off, all teeth out, multi platoon, yes. you be talking, you know, Stuart Recce spam, multiple, multiple rocket launcher profiles as, as one type of that list. Another one would be multiple small units in transports with, with flamethrowers and machine guns in the transports. That's another really common one. Um, or, yeah. or you'd expect kind of splat lists that have lots of Taichi, lots of templates. And they come in lots of different varieties. They come in lots of different nations, but these are these are lists you would expect to see on the way up. So your gatekeeper list was was more of a horde one, right? Yes, it was. Um, and so I, typically, a horde list runs um, either lots of infantry squads or very large infantry squads, uh, or it will run uh, more of a multiple small units type impact. And right. that's actually closer to what mine was. So I ran an inexperienced horde, so everything was then just inexperienced across the board, so tick that victory point. <laughs> but I ran it as multiple small units, and so in the Soviet list in particular, because I'm spoiled for choice, um, I took two light machine gun squads uh, initially as my first two troops' choices with double machine guns in them. Yep. Uh, the theatre selector that I used was... Uh, <laughs> So it's 1943, February to March. It was actually the third battle of Kharkov list right. where they were throwing infantry into the meat grinder. Um, but it's subtitled A Fatal Attraction, which <laughs> not many people necessarily knew. Uh, and it was a case of, uh, you're not allowed to take veterans as part of that theater selector. So I ignored that because I wasn't going to take them anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that was kind of the only downside, except the innate downside of being inexperienced. So that yeah. minus one to shoot and, and the leadership bump and stuff. Uh, and then I got to my list. So spoiler alert, it's 20 dice. <laughs> um, so... I chose, <laughs> I know, I'm already people listening to this having flashbacks. Uh, um, okay. So I took, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so I took a first lieutenant with two assistants, so no small team bonus. You broke the rules, Dan. With rifles, not even submachine guns. Oh, you broke both of the rules. I feel like we both just went in, let's, let's break all of the conventional wisdom we can. And try to do our best. <laughs> do, do you know? Do you know? In most game systems, the easiest way to become a gatekeeper list is to bring something completely opposite of what your meta brings, and and then suddenly everyone's like, I I can't deal with this. I don't understand. How this yeah, that although that is an extremely high risk, high reward scenario because there's often a very good reason why a lot of people don't bring that. 
<laughs> I think there's 18 players questioning some of those reasons. <laughs> but, um, uh, well, um, that's that's the beauty of bolt action. It's like it's not all about points efficiencies. Anyways, yeah, no, you have right. you have 17 more dice to work through, Dan. Yeah, uh, nine, 19 more dice. That was just three models. Uh, so well, well the, and, and your two infantry Oh, the two squad. light machine guns. Yeah, 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 two light machine gun squads um, with uh, two light machine guns each. So they were about fire suppression. Um, then I took a 12-man submachine gun squad with a light machine gun, which is also something you don't normally do because those weapon profiles are completely opposite to one another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I took, obviously, the free 12 rifles that you get yeah, as green yep. as a rifle squad for being Soviet because they were free and there was no dice cap and there was no order limits. And so I went, click. Um, <laughs> and then I took um, partisan squads. Now, these are not the right. partisan squads out of the France and the Allies books. These are specifically Soviet partisans. Right, okay. Um, from memory, I think their profiles are almost identical anyway. Um, but I took three units of five and upgraded them or technically downgraded them to be shirkers. Right, of course. Uh, and gave them all a light machine gun. Now, when you do all the computational mass at the end of that, every five-man squad costs 40 points. On average, yeah. Uh, no, so... The, oh, sorry, the, you the, just meant the partisan. The five-man partisan yeah, 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 squads yeah. were 40 points each with a light machine gun. <sighs> Disgusting. <laughs> now... The shirkers rule is particularly painful, um, and so I did have to watch out for that. And that's the rule where they always have to take an order test before they do anything, even if they don't have any pins. And any pins that they have, they count as double for the purposes of order tests. And no and so, other purposes, right? Just the and order no other purposes. Yeah, okay. yeah, just the order test. Um, and that was... Um, it became very important to have a first officer who didn't just simply die when getting shot at because yeah. he needed to make sure the other guys did what they were told. And I did have instances where the circus just went, not playing, no, <laughs> not, not doing it. Um, so that was the core infantry. And so my infantry selections, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So I had seven infantry units. Right, but okay. I only had about thirty troops. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's and so that that was that was MSU the split. right there. Yeah. 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 So the yeah. same number of models just subdivided out into smaller groups. Yeah. Um, typically, the purpose with what I was trying to do there is generate more opportunities to to convert those pins over because I was running an experience. Yeah. So I really needed those extra dice to be thrown every turn as separate order allocations to try and tick them over. Um, and then it went on. Uh, so I took four anti-tank rifle teams uh, okay. as inexperienced for 21 points each. Or 20, <laughs> yeah, 21 points each. And I can assure you they made their points back in not necessarily every game altogether, yeah, but across yeah, yeah. the time that I was playing, they each did something that was worthwhile. I took two forward deploying tank hunter anti-tank teams. Yep. So this, this was literally two men one with um, both with rifles and one with a Panzerfaust. Yeah. Uh, so again, could have given them submachine guns, chose not to. Uh, so two of those, a light mortar team, a Ziz-2 anti-tank gun, because I couldn't be bothered paying an extra five points for the Ziz-3 with dual purpose ammunition. <laughs> so it's simply the anti-tank gun. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> that, that particular decision I don't understand, but I'm, I'm sure you'll tell me. Um, all I'll say is it worked actually, but um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I'll talk to you about how it was used in our game, of course. But um, a BA six four B, which is the um, the only concession I made was the BA six four B actually. So it's a um, armored car with a light machine gun yep. that has recce, and I did pay the extra five points to make it enclosed rather than open topped. Yeah, because it's a as an inexperienced one, the points were essentially there to use. And, I and actually, those pins were really going to hurt. Yeah, and I actually really think that that armored car enclosed is a really good order dice. It's to grab. so good. It's, it's, it's so awesome. It's not expensive. <laughs> it's a mobile bulletproof uh, LMG. It's going to, like, yeah, fine, it's only an LMG, but, like, how do you deal with it? <laughs> well, and, and the, the, thing, the thing is, like, you know, and even in, in when I get talking about the first game, its primary purpose is to duck out and buzz off a couple of shots at the end of the first turn to annoy your opponent. And yeah. your opponent goes, right, I'm going to deal with that. And so they line it up for a shot and you just go, wreck you. Yeah. You yeah. just disappear. I've still got 19 dice. What do I care? Exactly. Um, exactly. Uh, 
And then I followed up with, I had two trucks that were then going to support the, the, the free yep. rifle unit and the submachine gun yep. unit to get Makes them sense. up the field yep. and get them engaged. Um, and then I took an inexperienced KU ship, which lost me friends. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a very, um, very gatekeeper pickup, inexperienced multiple rocket launchers. I mean, the, the, the rocket launcher itself, I was actually surprised we didn't see many more of them. Um, uh, in I fact, there was only one other one there. Uh, oh, yeah, you meant across the tournament. I was just going to say the, yeah. the other restrictions that we forgot to mention was maximum of three flamer profiles, and yeah. I think it was a max of one multiple rocket launcher profile. Correct. Right. Uh, yeah, so, but that being said, it's not like we saw everybody take a multiple rocket launcher, which I think is where you're coming no. from. In fact, the only other person that did also took an inexperienced Soviet list. Yeah. An inexperienced multi launcher. Yeah. Um, you sure? Yeah, I think his his list had a lot more flame throw, so <laughs> Well considering I had zero. Um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm I'm really glad. It's kind of one of those things where um because we play Axis V allies as our bread and butter here at WA, it I don't come across Soviet lists. Um, and so playing against two of them on the event, I was just like, good God, I am never playing Axis because <laughs> <laughs> I did not want to play against Soviets. It's it's obnoxious to say the least. So this is the guy who brought two medium tanks too. Uh, yeah, look, um, well, and and let's, let's be honest, let's reflect in the real end results. I mean, I... I unfortunately ended up with a did not finish. Yeah. Um, so I was called away on the second day and couldn't finish up, which, uh, yeah, it still hurts. But, um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but you, on the other hand. Yeah, managed to take out the tournament yeah. undefeated, best allied. I think there's there's two, two things I will definitely um, kind of caveat the win on, is that, one, I very much think that frontal assault is not the best competitive mission um from this is bolt action from the bolt action alliance players back oh yeah we'll, we'll go through the mission so we'll go, we'll go through the missions, um yeah. what was what was round one the first one was punch through punch through so it was three bolt action alliance missions and then one from the core rule book so it was punch through yeah. which is a cross of um objectives around the center some distance and there's a little game of movement that you can play with your opponent before the game starts yep. then it's frontal assault where the table is divided uh diagonally uh one of you there's a roll off for attack a defender and placing table sides the it's a tough mission the defender gets two objectives the attacker gets or well, attacker gets zero there's one in the neutral point 50 percent have to be in reserves and, and a few other things like that but the key thing about frontal assault that a lot of people did not read um, as it came up when we were doing post-game scoring, I heard, overheard it from other tables, was that the objectives don't work like normal objectives. They yeah. are flipped. They are not controlled or contested. So the two objectives in the defender zone start in the defender's control and the other one is neutral. How you flip them is by having an allied unit within three inches or having a unit of yours within three inches and no enemy units within three inches. There is yep. no such and thing as a con me. yeah. There's yep. no such thing as a contested objective. It's yep. either uh, it's either for the defender ones. It's either the defenders or the attackers. There is no such thing as a contested objective, uh, and yep. to th that pressure in in that you applied with your MSU list in round two. Uh, I think the only reason I won that mission was was because of the frontal assault design. Uh, which I think if you yeah. were if you were to do that mission competitively, I would flip the placement of the objective so you'd have one the defender, two the neutral. But yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get to that a little bit more later on when we dive into it. <laughs> um, getting ahead of ourselves here, uh, and then then we then we had Kitty Hawk down. So yeah, Kitty Hawk down is mission three, and then mission four was demolition. Um, yeah, the, sorry, I, another the, interesting choice for an event. The the tangent I was going off here was that. Um, the two caveats is one, I think the only reason I got four wins was, was one was the frontal assault design. Um, and then the second part was that nobody took an armored platoon. Um, yeah. Which surprised the TO, it surprised a few of us. Uh, also, I think, I guess it just goes to speak to that self-regulation that we talk about a lot. 
Um, I mean, the door was wide open. It really for, was. For the six Recky Stewart machine gun platoons for, to be a valid, uh, like almost a valid drop in to be able to yeah. go. Yeah, sure, sure, bring them. Like fire 100 shots a turn, go nuts. <laughs> I, think, I think the other... The other potential armored platoon would have been, um, I can't remember where, which exact book it is, but you can get the canister shell for the stewards. And I think you can get them for the chaffees as well. I think. Um, and so it, it, I've, I've heard it mentioned a couple of times. I haven't been able to go find the book yet. So, so, you know, big, big spoonful of salt with that one. Canisters. Canisters pretty nasty. I yeah. think it was Nathan Patrick that took those to one of the events previously yeah. and it just made a mess of people because and, and, they weren't and, ready for it. Right. And this is this is the thing, because like when if you take if you take a chaffee over a steward, similar points, but you get the two inch, you get the you know, you get a slightly tougher tank and all the other sorts of stuff, you don't get as many machine guns. So I was from a US perspective, I was either expecting to see a Stewart spam or a Chaffee spam or like a mixed Stewart Chaffee spam with some canisters in there as well, but didn't happen. And so I think, mm. yeah, if I came across a, a, a light tank armored platoon, I would have had much more trouble with my two Sherman. So that was that was basically the, the core, um, th that, that's me putting my caveats out of the way. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, undefeated for four rounds, which which feels really good. So I guess we'll, we'll go into the rounds now, Dan. How was, how was your first round? Who were you up against? Yeah, so my first round, I matched up against um, Quinn. Uh, one of, so he's uh, on the Perth side of yeah. the trek coming down. Uh, sort of comes and goes in the community as well. Yep, yep. Um, and that's sort of, you know, he doesn't get a chance to get to every single event. Um, he hadn't played for a while before he met me. And yeah. so it was a little bit of a crucible of fire to then have to fight my 20 dice list. Um, yeah. And not only fight the 20 dice list, but fight the 25 dice, sorry, the 20 dice list against me, who was kind of switched on about going like, I yeah, need to play yeah, 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 yeah. so fast because I've only got, because the time, it was a two hour round. Um, and so still pretty I generous like, for, for 888 points. You get full two hours. Was it? It didn't feel like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I suppose when I'm doing three times as many actions for everybody's other action that they do, um, yeah. well, I was probably putting myself under a bit of pressure, but um, yeah. Yeah, so, so we played on a, um, one of the wonderful boards that was provided um, for the guys down in Albany. It had a big church in the middle um, yep. with, a, with a fence and a sort of set of graveyards around it and then some town buildings on the outside. Uh, I was given the choice of, t uh, of table side. Um, uh, no, I lost the role for table side, but Quinn chose the side he was on. Um, and that actually gifted me two sets of essentially hedgerow. Right, or, yeah. Um, letting obstacles. So I, I understand... Yeah that's a very useful thing to do in a tournament setting is go, I'm going to take this side of the table because I'm standing on it. But honestly, yep. if you win the table side roll, just take look. a good 30 second, 30 to 60 second look at the table uh, because the terrain was a big part of my wins as well. Yeah. So if, so if I had, I mean, the, the side I ended up with was actually the side that I wanted yeah, when I looked perfect. at the table because yeah. it had those linear, those two linear um, obstacles. What it essentially meant was that I could hide the core of my infantry with all of its inexperienced mm -hmm. light machine mm -hmm. guns behind two levels of that, which meant that I could barely be seen. Yeah. And I always I had two very strong defensive positions that I could just simply sit on because the other part is when we did the little game of moving the objectives, he moved one that was, uh, so if you think about the star, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he moved the one that was closest to him further down towards him. I probably wouldn't have done that. It was out in the open, so I get why he did it. Yeah. Um, I probably would have left that one alone and moved one of the side objectives first, um, which is what I ended up doing. Yeah, okay. And so I, shift, I shifted, so our box ended up a bit more like this. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Flipped out like this, and I was able to cap essentially mm -hmm, across mm -hmm. um, the others. Uh, and so his one that he'd moved further away, yes, I struggled to I struggled to get to that one. Um, but because I was able to put a lot of pressure on the ones that were closer to me, um, it wasn't a problem. And when we get to, you were saying about why did I bother taking an anti-tank gun? It's interesting because yes, it's only a one inch HE shell. No, um, sorry, I don't understand why you didn't take the five point upgrade to a Ziz 3. Oh, That's the part that I don't get. Let me see. Let me see. Because I was, I only had three points left. 
So okay. I, ha- I would have had to have skimped points somewhere to get an extra two points to then, which because I was already skimping on points, that was pretty difficult. I, I kind um, of feel like I have to say this just just for everybody at home who's currently cringing and rocking in their chairs. I don't know, Dan, maybe take the LMG out of your goddamn SMG squad and get a Sith 3. <laughs> That, that all right i've said my now, piece i've said my piece it's done interesting interestingly enough um yeah I'll, I'll get to that and why i did that in a second yeah um because there's a very specific reason that i did it um so, and it wasn't point efficient that i did it um but yeah anyway so uh, i was able to get the last drop of deployment of where i wanted the anti-tank rifle the anti-tank gun to go yeah and um he put his SU-76 down the bottom end of a road. Oh, uh, and right, so I, okay. just, I just simply went, I literally the best threat that I can shoot at is the, the Ziz, um, sorry, with the yeah, Ziz yeah. 2 is the SU-76. And so I sort of, I then p- positioned it up against the side of a building and just, just far enough in front that I could see the tank on the angle to get the shot off. But if I got shot at in return, I was probably going to get cover for it. Yeah, okay. And then just to be sure, I put an infantry unit in front. Um, <laughs> that that way, if he shot at me, I was getting cover, and if I was going to go for the shot, I'd just move the unit. Um, <laughs> You've got 20 I, dice. It I played hard. Like it <laughs> I, I played hard. Oh, no, I did. Um, <laughs> the, the, the things that really, um, I think, so I ended up winning that game. Um, so I kept, well I kept the objectives. Um, I was contesting the one that he was on and he only had three lone infantry models from three different units that were actually on that last objective. Ouch. And I had I had eight rifles, three rifles um, that had upgraded to regular sitting in contestion range. And I had two other units with three light machine guns firing down range at them trying to peg them off. Um, and an anti tank rifle, I think. Um, my multi-launcher... Um, cause he had a full squad yeah, yeah, sitting yeah, yeah. on that objective and I was, I was like, that's going to be a bit tough. So I'll go clear out this building and then I'll come across and the multi-launcher rocks up and goes, what's up? And just deletes <laughs> the unit. <laughs> I, like, I hate multi-launcher so much. I, I like, and, and the, the beauty is like, this one was, I've already painted it, but I, honestly, I might go back and do something more because it, it's put a kill ring on it. Moves and it moves and fires, which is fantastic. <sighs> It hit in every game that it played. It rolled onto the board and insta hit something. I was just like, I, it has no right to be doing any of this. Um, Look, I have some good news. There is a the US now have a Katusha. Um, yay! Uh, I think it was in in, in the Maranao Islands. Look, yeah, yeah. The, we've got a Katusha now. I'm I'm calling it the the Katyanksha. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, okay, so. Um, uh, any so any anyway, sort so, of fun tactic strategy? Any oh, yeah. little tricks that you pulled off in that yeah. one? So in in the second turn, where Quinn probably should have advanced his FSU seventy six because it was on a road and he could have repositioned, mm. um, and he wasn't behind any cover. He was just simply out in the open. Mm. Um, he instead chose to sit still and fire, yeah. um, which means that he doesn't take the minus one for yeah. the movement and the firing. And so I can't. You know, if he hit with it and destroyed the target, then you know that would have been. He's got free range. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, so I have to sort of just go. Yep, that was what he wanted to do. Um, I, I don't think it was necessarily a wrong move, but what it allowed me to do was the truck full of submachine gunners. Um, I just drove up on an advance twenty four inches and parked in front of it <laughs> sideways. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so you just and blocked that it was, into the corner. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Of course he did. Um, and that was, you know, and that was very much obviously a, um, in regular tournament etiquette, I would not have done such a thing. Um, in my regular tournament etiquette, I probably wouldn't have actually stooped to that point, but because my inexperienced list, um, I didn't really have any other options to deal with it. And right. I went this way, I can use my anti tank gun to sling one inch HE double pins at something else yeah, yeah okay um and so i was like i'm just going to lock it up and he's going to have to either shoot the truck or destroy it or whatever i don't care um and so what he did instead was bring a unit on from reserve and then my smg unit and his unit slogged it out and he ended up winning the fight oh okay it took it took it took so long <laughs> um but by the time he got through them all because i was passing yeah of course yeah, yeah. No right to pass um 
in any way. And I was changing dice and stuff. I'm going, this isn't right. We're going to change this out. It's like, roll 12. <laughs> okay, well, I'm staying. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so th- there was definitely a few bits and pieces where, uh, you know, because of the number of dice that I had, um, it allowed me the opportunity to activate when we wanted pretty much unopposed mm. mm-hmm. and, and, mm-hmm. and really apply our pressure. So what it, what I needed to make sure of as the player was then to make sure that my target priority and my my target acquisition of where I needed to put pins on things was spot on because you pick up seven dice for my LMG squads, providing they pass their shirker test. Yeah. Roll. And what am I, what am I needing to hit? I was average sixes or yeah, probably of course. sevens yeah, yeah, yeah. for most of it, just just by default of what it was. And so um, my sweet spot is like, you know, most people are like, oh, you know, I got a whole unit that lighted them up on threes. And I was like, I got a whole unit that lighted up on fives. <laughs> um, but but the, but it was simply through attrition of the number of pins. And eventually, and you probably would have noticed this in any game, it's like, I just cleared those pins and you've put three more in. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did apologize actually to Quinn after the game because when I was – when I was drafting with this list, when I was, um, I did a little bit of digital playing on Tabletop Simulator. Oh, yeah. I did a little bit of paper playing because I'm, firstly, I wanted to understand how quickly do I need to make decisions to get mm-hmm. to turn five? Because that was obviously a key thing. If I wasn't able to play it and actually get to turn five, I wasn't going to bring it. Yeah, I think both games. I think sort of as a good rule of thumb, getting to the tail end of turn five on any tournament is it's a good benchmark like it's not it's not great you obviously want to get to the end of turn six every game and have 15 minutes left for the for the four plus if there's a turn seven especially on a two hour time slot but but most games of bolt action are are usually decided by the tail end of turn five so you should be getting to your last couple of units if you're doing that pretty reliably then you're doing okay you don't need to worry too much about speed Obviously, you know, keep in the back of your mind that it's a six possible seven turn game, but just just something to keep in mind. And I, and I tried really hard not to um, simply stall on a decision. And yeah. I was just I was taking decisions where I'm like, this probably isn't the best decision, but I need to make one, and it's the only one right now that's floating to the surface that yeah. I can compute. Therefore, I'm going to take it. Um, and so, in both games, I got to the bottom of turn five in them. Yeah. Um, in Quinn's game, yeah, like, like he basically lost his um, left flank. There were three infantry models left, and on his other flank, he had two units of infantry, but one needed to sit on the objective, and one could run forward. But I had three or four infantry units. They were only like um, again small infantry units. Yeah. But I had I had enough there that it was going to be. Um, problematic for yeah, him to yeah. actually capture it which still meant that it was going to be a um to uh, do objective to probably mm-hmm. zero or to one in my favor so i was still going to win on that anyway as opposed to our game where you know we, i wouldn't play our game any different to be honest for round two um and i'll get yeah. into that when we recap round two uh, yeah so so my round one i was up against ben which is an albany local it was new to bolt action he was the ringer gumby for the event um I think he played a couple of games of bolt action. He was well, honestly a fabulous sport. I really hope he, he stays in the community and comes back. Unfortunately, the game was not particularly easy for him. Um he had a, a, a Japanese list that had one unit of bamboo spearmen. Um I think it was a medium or medium howitzer, a sniper, three squads of ten with an LMG and an officer, uh, and a medium mortar as well. Uh, and, and it's not too bad to be honest. It, look it's a it's a very kind of um this is bolt action list there's 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 no funk in it there's there's very little like uh, um armies of imperial japan in it yeah. you know no 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 grenadier squads no near mortars um you know things no, that they no lunch miners uh sorry he had two lunch miners as well um you know and but even even all that together it's like yeah it's got a little armies of imperial japan but but you could you could almost kind of carbon copy that into any nation yeah and so yeah we were playing of course we were playing the same mission um we i moved the objective on my right a few inches that way just to get it off road and into cover and he moved it a little bit further back um which which was okay oh so he he moved the same one yeah he moved it a little further Mm -hmm. back um and and he actually won the uh, the table side roll off again 
Uh, same same as in, in your situation, your opponent had it. And he picked the side of the table that he was standing on. Um, and, and, you know, I was like, yeah, man, fair enough. I do that all the time. It's a good pick. And then I looked at the table and went, oh, he really did me a favor. Um, oh, yeah. Just just because he had, and I talked to, to, to Gilly about this after the event, he had kind of a 24 by 24, roughly, box of fence um, on his side of the table. And of course, that meant he could only advance over it. Yeah. Um, and only one of the objectives was in that box. Ooh, okay. Uh, then, and it wasn't the closest one. The closest one was in a river next to it. So you know, he could he could he could run or adv- he could run onto that objective from his first wave, no problem. But yeah. it it meant that like, you know, he couldn't do two turns of running and then be in contestion for the other objectives. Uh, and and you know yeah. I did I did kind of two turns a, a run and then an advance and I was holding one of the midfield objectives, mm-hmm. uh, and then on the other side of that obstacle was a road and then there was a hedge that we talked about was line of sight blocking, so I could basically advance with impunity into knife fighting range against him. Now of course I didn't want to do that because getting into knife fighting range with the Japanese is a great way to get murdered, um, but. I, I hear they're pretty dangerous in combat, and and it was it it was a lot of like little bits of tit for tat at the start, and then you know he he moved his medium mortar on, I moved a couple of infantry squads on here and there, uh, and then I was waiting for his howitzer to come out. His howitzer came out, and it was in a nice open field. Makes sense. It had a gun shield, um, really good sight lines, but there was there was like a stone wall, a double stone wall that split the map lengthways. So it meant that if he was firing from, yeah, his howitzer was mostly centered, but it was a little skewed uh, off center. So if he was firing across his hard cover, yeah, by and, default, and range. range, cause he's no longer shooting like dead on. Now, yeah, sure. You know, medium, medium howitzer getting range on a, a direct, the range modifying or direct shots, not super common, but I'm like, man, I'll take fives all day, you, you know, especially yeah because that was one of his main anti-tank threats. Um, yeah. I was like, man, I'll take I'll take five of a medium howitzer hitting one of my Shermans every day of the week. And so once that was out, um, and obviously I couldn't do anything about his lunge miners, he moved his big block of infantry basically through that that wheat field is where he was blocked in. But it, was right. a, it wasn't a dense wheat field. It was, there was basically like a couple of hay bales in there and that's it. So yeah. he had no cover when I was up against the fence. And of course he had neg one at least like cover shooting across the fence shooting back Whoa. yeah and so then um you know i very luckily advanced one of my shermans on took 10 mmg shots at the medium mortar from like hard cover way downtown and i kill it <laughs> and I'm like, that's okay. what we like to see <laughs> okay fine. And then he's just like okay it's going to be that kind of game uh, and then and then he moves a sniper onto onto that that objective and then um you know, I had my 12 man squad, 12 man squad, my two sixes and my Shermans were kind of moving up through the middle in the windmill. And, and I had a howitzer there as well, but I kind of didn't have any sight lines because of that big line of hedge for my howitzer. Um, I actually ended up running it for four turns and I only fired it twice. We didn't have getting to turn six, like one, of, it was two indirects and it was like, it was like, uh, okay. <laughs> Cause I just didn't really, I couldn't see much. Uh, yeah, and I was like, I might as well try to get him onto an objective. Uh, and so I kept. It's funny when it's funny when that actually becomes like it's like okay, I can only move six a turn, but if I start now, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rule number one: do cardio. Uh, so I used one six man squad to capture the backfield objective. Sent the other six man squad on my right flank to capture the objective that we moved, and he was moving his bamboo spearman over, and I was able to get that squad um, into position into hard cover against that alley without being line of sight to the howitzer. I was like, these guys are uh, safe because yeah. if they're basically the opposite side of his main force, all they have to do is survive against the bamboo spearmen. And and so I kept the 12 man squad kind of in the middle, ready to move left or right, depending on how it went. Um, you know, I moved my other 12 man squad up, killed the lunge miner, rolled the Shermans forward, killed the second lunge miner. And then I was like, uh, I mean, the lunge point is meant to kill the Sherman, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, and then I just kind of went, he, he can't answer this. So then yeah. I just rolled my Shermans up to his fence and I was just 
point blanking units with main guns or MMG in this like 24 by 24 kill box. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, I, I moved my, I advanced my guys up against hard cover, shot at the bamboo spearmen, killed the whole bunch. Um, they charged me next turn. I got the fire before they charged because the turn had ticked over. That's and then, terrible. and then it was a defended obstacle and it was like basically even numbers of regulars versus Ooh. inexperienced. Um, and so we went to a couple of rounds of combat, but I did win it. But at that point I had like three guys, three guys left in the squad. Nobody could see them and they're yeah. on the objective. I was like, okay, like, okay, okay. Uh, and then he had his third squad come off reserve. My, one of my 12 man squads was in the killing field. And because he, you know, he went down, obviously when I shot at him and his officer was there, I was actually having a hard time killing the units. I was taking yeah. chunks out of them. Um, but it took but not a, actually killing them off. Yeah, it probably took about two or three turns of Shermans just gunning this wheat field to actually kill three or four units. <laughs> just bits and bits of wheat just sort of yeah. flying everywhere. <laughs> and then uh, his, he, you know, his his ten man squad came on, and I had a squad of seven. And uh, at that point, there were like three pins, and yeah, everybody was kind of shooting at each other at that point. Uh, my other twelve man squad just sauntered towards his sniper team, just. Advance, shoot, advance, shoot, advance, shoot. Finally killed them. Um, I ended up having three objectives out of the four. I had my seven-man squad on four pins. I declared a charge against this officer because that was the only thing holding that objective. And I was like, "It's the I'm last really dice. Of, it's the last it. dice of turn six. This is the only way I can get that objective." Of course, it fails. They just go down, um, and then that—that that was the game. So I. <laughs> Did, did, I thought you were going to tell me a miraculous story uh, of insane courage. No, I'm just I'm just a Japanese officer cutting down like seven guys. Uh, I would have loved to see that. Um, it's it's actually secretly what I was hoping for because because Ben and I would have had a great time watching this officer just like, um, yeah, cut down all these dudes. But no, uh, yeah, it was it was uh, three three out of four to me. Plus, I think I got all bar two of his order dice as well because it was one point for order dice so yeah it was it was um it was a good good first round um for me at mm. least and, and ben ben had a good time uh, which is the important part uh, i think it's yeah. it, it's very it's actually this is something that that i think um people need to be more aware of it's very easy to have a good time playing bolt action and play competitively I think for, for whatever reason, some people think that if you're winning and demolishing your opponent, then uh, you're either a dick or that person's having a bad time. Like those those three things aren't always true at the same time. You can you can be a good player and a good sport and make sure your opponent is having fun and still win. Those things are possible. Well, and, and even, you know, you put, because I was making some commentary before as, as we were getting into some of the trash talking as leading into the event and all the things that do. And, um, you know, I was so sure that I was going to get pantsed. I was, I was going to go zero four. I was absolutely sure that that's what was going to happen. And, and so I was, I was making some, probably some rash statements and you were just like, just um, chill for a sec, Dan. There's a lot of things that can happen on the day. Yeah. And yeah. as it turned out, you know, um, I sort of had to eat crow a little bit because <laughs> I won, won the first game. I gave you a run for your money. On oh, round two. <laughs> God, I never want to remember round two. We have to. We've got to tell the listeners what happened. All right, I go mean, ahead, Dan. You, 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 did, you did win. So this this was on the frontal assault mission. And, and I will... The objectives have to flip. I will happily hand over that win to you. And and even at the, <laughs> at the end of the round, I was like, look, we'll score it. That's what the rules say. But I, I, I'm fairly certain you've said this. I was like, Dan, as far as I'm concerned, you won that mission. Like, Yeah, look, it's... It was, I don't know if I would be willing to say that I would claim victory for you. Um, <laughs> I think it would have been a draw. I don't think I would have had enough to the win, um, but I, I do think it probably would have been draw. But we really need to talk about what happened. <laughs> yeah, go so, ahead. I mean, so, look, let's let's le re replay round two. I had eight dice in the bag. You had 20. I just sat there and watched you pin my units for two hours <laughs> and watched your MRL hit four units. Uh, never yeah, again. So, um, so Gorchen had... Um, so he was playing defense and was trying to move on and maintain a defensive line to be able to put, repel the inexperienced hordes. The board we were playing on had um, a lot of forest and a couple of buildings mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. it. Um, 
uh, but it was actually I thought it was fairly okay um, in yeah. terms of its its terrain density. It felt felt kind of good. The forests were a good size. Yeah, I think Some it was big, it was outcrops. It was maybe light on scatter. Correct. Uh, yep. if, if but again, that's there's no. That's good uh, reference. There's no requirement for there to be scatter. Yeah. It was basically you either had blocks of forests or buildings, or that was about it, which is but a that's, perfectly that's reasonable our, table. Yeah, that's why I fired the smoke gorge, and so we would have scatter. Um, yes, I used smoke. Um, no, it was not effective. Yes, I'll do it again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just, uh, just every time you fired it and it missed, I just put it in front of your Ziz too. <laughs> And that leads me to, you know, what was I going to be using my Ziz 2 for? Well, I, I, because of what was happening, I actually had to move my Ziz 2. And so I was like, blow it. I'm just, I'm just going to run it up to the side of the house then and start just point blanking the objectives. And so that was my plan was to actually just run the Ziz 2 to where my infantry currently were. So and if you managed to somehow survive, I was just going to start hitting you with... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, there was no way I was going to answer that particular movement anyway. It was, um, so if we just, I guess, talk through the game. So I I think you picked table side and yeah. I got to choose attacker defender. And yes. and I read this mission, I actually read through the players back several times for the event and, and kind of built quick strategies in my head. I looked at that mission and I went, do not play attacker. Whatever, if you get the choice, don't pick attacker, pick defender. And then, and then I looked at your list and we talked through it and then I got the defender role and I was like, you have shirkers? I was just like, by all means, my friend, you can come to me. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. I was like, and I remember that you immediately said something like, I had all of these strategy plans for how to play this mission in defense. And in defense, defense yes. Because I was, I was sure that my opponents were going to turn around and go in, attacking inexperienced guys oh let's do it and, and you you of course didn't because you did what i did and read the mission and went attacking is really hard on this mission yes um, and so so yes i had uh i had planned out where my objectives were going to go how we were going to anti off i had um wherever my the opponent put their objective i knew where my optimal placement was for the other objective so i could defend it better and keep it further away um ironically it's exactly what you did um <laughs> <laughs> um, and so anyway, so I was put into a position where I suddenly had to attack and I drew a box on my, um, on my little diagram of like, if I have to attack, it makes most sense to put virtually everything in this smaller little deployment zone. Yeah. And I drawn on my yeah, map yeah, a, yeah, little, yeah. a little parallelogram and that's pretty much where I deployed everything. Um, it's it's that so, death ball square punch yeah. thing in bolt yeah. action. Just, yeah. just was, pick a and, point and drive it. And I'm just going to have to force hard and just go in. I knew I had the forward deploying anti-tank teams. And so because I deliberately put my objective as the attacker on that midline yeah. center, I was able to flip that one very easily because you weren't in contestion. It's very typical for that first one to get flipped by the attacker. Um, and then the defender will just let it go because they've still got two. Why would they bother going for the third? I, I will point out, though, that, that like... You moved the first couple of dice. You moved some some units forward. You, you, I think you failed a, a shurken roll or two. Or, oh no, we we went down with all of our units at first, so we just milled them In out reserve. of the bag. Um, and then and then you, your your unit was on it, and I knew the objective flipped at the end of the turn. So I was like, I'll just indirect it with my howitzer. Uh, <laughs> and I th I think you went down um, in response. Uh, just because why the hell not? You're on the objective anyway. And then yeah. I remember I was like. I need a six to hit. There's no way. But if I get it, you can't move anything else onto it. I mean, it's just, it's not going to delay you because if you've got 20 dice, you can chuck another unit on it. But I'm like, at least it'll be funny. And I roll it and I get the six. And I remember both of us just like yelling and hooting. And then we, we were, because it was the sort of thing where like you were looking at it going, okay, I have one howitzer shot and I need to make the most impact with this howitzer shot that I possibly can. And realistically, and we looked down the board, it's like, Dan's been a jerk and hidden everything. And I can really, really see these guys. So no, we're just going to go for them. And, uh, I get the and, and I remember you rolling it. And I just and I just went, well, you got to roll to hurt them. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I rolled a one to wound. I didn't even kill one. There was a possibility that they were going to hang around, and I was just like, "Oh, this would be classic if I if they if he." And then I was like, "No, I've got to do my Soviet morale check," and he failed that, and he ran, so it was okay. But um, but it, but it was like it was very much like that one guy was potentially just going to go. 
no. <laughs> And and then and then to your credit, you moved other juicier targets in front of my howitzer, so I yeah. I gave up on the zeroing. I mean, I was zeroed in, but I was like, "You've already flipped the objective. It's yes. two guys, one Panzerfaust. I have a whole bunch of infantry around. I don't care. I'm going to go yeah. shoot some other priority targets." So so credit to you by giving by presenting target saturation, right? Because it would have been the, the easiest, or arguably, I think you actually moved the unit before I got to that two plus anyway. But even if you didn't, I still would have had a really time just a really hard time justifying hitting that unit on the two plus at that point yes. in the turn. Uh, and this was yep. round two, right? So this is the thing that we talk about. It's like, yeah, somebody zeroed in, but I think you had a squad out in the open in front of my howitzer, or it might have been, or might have been Zs two or out. something like that. I was like, I gotta. Yep. I don't you care about these two guys with rifles on, on the objective that's already flipped and a Panzerfaust. Like, I don't care. Take it. I'll risk the further shot. Yeah, yeah. Run. yeah. And and I did find when playing it through in practice, um, the the biggest the biggest parts of my list that uh, that needed concentrating on was that target priority which yeah. I talked about earlier. Um, and then also um, trying to be deceitful in where my attacks were going to come from. Uh, so I've got 20 units, yeah, double of them yeah. attacking units. But how can I how can I psychologically hide what I'm actually going to try to do before I'm ready to spring my trap? And and that was very hard. Even though I've got 20 units to do things with, um, you know, it, it was about I've got to try and distract you. I've got to try and throw units out that I actually I don't want you to kill it. But I actually would prefer you kill this than this other thing that I'm going to do. Yeah, um, and, and then and I had to do that the whole game. Yeah, and, and not the, not that you really needed much help on that one. I couldn't kill a damn thing in our game. Um, this is I, true. Ha- I had so just 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 before I move on to round two, round one, um, you uh, I had a unit. We had I got hit by prep bombardment, and I lost one guy out of my howitzer crew, and, that, and, and then a few smattering of pins. I had a squad of six on one pin. The first officer wasn't next to them, so it was, so it was a morale eight. You move a squad of five, and I looked at where those guys were, and I was like, if they pass the order check with an advance, I can expose myself to only this one squad. Inside of 12 inches, I'm not going to be exposed to any other other units, and it's going to be, I think it was seven or eight shots. Hitting on threes, wounding on threes. I was like, it's a dead squad. And then I, I yes. roll it, and I get an 11, and I'm like, oh, okay, all right. I will go down <laughs> on a single bit. Uh, and then and then round two rolls over. One of my Shermans... It's for, it foretelling, maybe. <laughs> yeah. And then round two, you run a squad into that building with my six-man yeah. squad having having a kit, having a lie down. That, that building is essentially 10 inches from his board edge because that unit yeah. ran for two turns to get there. And yeah. I did, I did that on the thought process that I was contesting the objective. <laughs> and, and look, even... even even though you weren't, it still forced me to get rid of the unit. Yes. Because uh, then all I had left at that point to really respond with was one of my squads of 12 went down in reserve. Yes. So I only had my other squad of 12 that was on the field. So my other squad of six was out in another flank. Um, ironically, I think we both took the same bait on that flank. Yeah, and we did. <laughs> Because because I wanted to do this big kind of like, oh, there's a squad of six over here. You don't know what they're going to do. They're regulars of the BAR. And then you threw a squad of 12 in a truck, SMGs at them, two anti tank teams, and your armored car at them. And I was like, I don't know which one of us took the bait, but I think we both did. No no joke. I remember I remember after moving the, because um, I was contemplating with the SMGs, yeah. I was like, oh, do, do I really need, like the SMGs will kill the unit and yeah, that'll yeah. just deal with it. Um, because I knew the inexperienced inexpi- rifles weren't going to be able to hold on, and the anti tank rifles were simply trying to get pins on the unit. And they were doing that just on. fine. Yeah, they were doing great. And I was like, if I commit the SMG unit here, I sacrifice the ability. What I was going to do is run them at thirty six, right? With one okay. pivot, and I was just going to go eighteen this way, eighteen that way, and be ready to hit your backline objective with yeah, the yeah, SMG yeah, yeah. unit. Yeah. And I went, I can't risk that you have a really good role because you've had some shocking roles. So I can't risk you have a really regression good to role the mean. <laughs> and you just compl- yeah, regression back to the standard of, of statistics. And you just like annihilate three units in the space of a turn magically. And then that SMG unit is actually needed to deal with that flank. Yeah. Um, and so I went, no, I'm going to overcommit. I knew I was overcommitting. 
and um, I did kill the unit. Um, but no but it, was, it was it was like I was like I got to you know, and they're all inexperienced or whatever. It's like I think I got to like I wasn't point blank range, but I was I was within twelve or whatever. Um, and it was still almost sixes to hit. Yeah, with it was yeah I mean, like it was just it was like this is ridiculous. Like I should be on like threes or twos. What's going on? Um, I was like, no, nah, fives for you. Uh, um, there were on three pins. Head. There was four of them left. You just hosed them. It was, it was no yeah, I just hosed them down. But um, that, this this squad of two not contesting one of my objectives in a building next to my deployment zone. I I had nothing to answer them with, and I knew if I yeah. it, it, defending any defensive line, I guess conceptually speaking, is one of those things that once one gets in the whole thing falls apart real quick. Yes. You gotta not let that first one in and you gotta fight tooth and nail. So I couldn't just leave the squad in there. So I, I move on a squad of 12 and I dump 14 shots. I think it was on like two guys in a building. Um, yeah, there weren't many left afterwards. So they, they all evaporated. Yeah, but I think it, I think it was like a Panzerfaust team or something. It wasn't. It wasn't like a, I don't I know. I think it was. I think it was the second tank hunter team. Right. Yeah. 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 And because yeah, they, they were they were behind the church and then they ran right, out yeah, yeah, and then your yeah. reserves didn't come on and I went oh they're alive and so I ran them further. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh yeah. My squad of six didn't come around the corner and hose them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the squad yeah. of twelve runs on and I kill them. But then I used a full squad of twelve riflemen. Um, in cover to kill two guys in a building <laughs> like it just felt so bad but i knew i had to do it especially because the way that the map had laid out and where you deploy where you deployed your sis and your other panzerfaust team meant that i had this really nice almost straight line from my board edge up to a piece of cover just in case anything tried to shoot at my sherman there was like cover in the way that i could just cut your force through straight line through your yeah. force and at that point there was line of sight blocking stuff in the way so i was only fighting you know squads of five Portion. inexperienced guys that's it easy and, and easy stuff to roll on and just hose with your machine guns. oh and then my shermans couldn't kill a thing <laughs> so uh, i had I had two units of five that were literally just point blank perfect targets in any other, literally ah. any other game that I play with Gorge, and he would have annihilated them. And both squads not only didn't die from being shot at, both squads were reduced and knocked down to two men or less <laughs> and passed their morale checks. <laughs> it was it was awful. So awful. And then my shermans came on piecemeal so you could react to them in terms of, you know, if one of them came on um, and then you did a whole bunch more activations and a second one came on, you, you know, you couldn't go down. I could just mow on through. But of course, one of them yeah. came on, turn, and the other one goes down, turn resets. I get my yeah. second squad of 12 on. In between this, you put seven pins on a 12-man <laughs> infantry squad in cover. I was like, good God, man. I managed to rally off most of them, but I was like, what is this nightmare that I exist in? What is and, and at that and point they were reduced down to like <laughs> still nine guys. I only lost still nine three. Guys. And I hadn't just... actually I, that, that was the funnier part. I'd put seven pins on you, but I hadn't killed seven infantry models. <laughs> it was <laughs> it could not believe it. Uh I think that's where the regression to the meme went, is that yes. like you got no no kills on your small arms. You just got a stupid amount of pins. And then, I mean, yeah. Then I, then I did then I did the thing, and then, and I rolled I rolled the multi launcher on. Um, and so Korchin has just got his second set of twelve on, and everybody has just got ready for the turn. And uh, I'm I'm in a I've good got, spot. I'm feeling fine. You're I in a good spot. Genuinely, I got both good Shermans spot. on. I got. One squad of six is is dead or about to die. The other squad of six is in cover. I got a, a squad of twelve is, is 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 in position, ready to do some work. The other one's reduced down to nine. They're on one or two pins. My first officer's there. My howitzer's on two guys. He's got line of sight. I'm good. I'm good. This, I was like, all right, this is this is the big second armored has rocked up. Here comes the big counter attack, and then and I position the multi launch. <laughs> I, I position the multi launcher and I look at his units and I'm like, where can I get the most impact? Where is my best line of fire? And I went, it is actually targeting the twelve guys on seven pins in cover already right yeah. now. They're probably yeah. the best the best target for me because if I tick over and generate three pins, they pin out and they just pop automatically. Yep. Um, and I was like, that that. I mean, if you play bolt action, you're really sorry. Don't lie about it. That always feels good. <laughs> um, Routing you. I missed that unit completely, but there were two others in range. Yeah, so and one squad of six closed. is dead. 
uh, and and the other squad of twelve gets reduced down to like four guys stretched over this huge line. Um, <laughs> and so Gorchin, Gorchin's defenses, whereas I feel really strong here, and they're on seven <laughs> pins. <laughs> Oh man! And then, and then, I, I guess like you keep pressing towards me. Um, oh, I was relentless. Yeah, everything your, I could. Just your just your forward. rifleman squad upgrades to regulars. Uh, <laughs> your SMG guys are, are still out of range. I managed to take a truck. Your armored cars moving forward, and I've I think I've slowly picked up maybe about four or five of your dice. I think yeah, here and like there. the ones and twos the, and the, the five mans that are. Yeah, yeah, the, the two Panzerfaust units I got, and I think I got a couple yeah. of the other squads and things like that, and and a transport, but and but it wasn't. Yeah, you're up to about five dice. Yeah, and I'm like, and then you know my Shermans are now now you've got no anti tank threats. I can see my Shermans, and I've parked them in front of my of my objective, um, yeah. the one that you were contesting. I was like, I have <laughs> created the Sherman wall. Good luck. Uh, machine guns are going to start blazing, and then your Katusha just deletes one of my shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so my father, my father-in-law came down because um, uh, he he lives near near Albany, and so he came down and was watching. And I literally had just made a comment to him after Gorchin had moved his Shermans in. I went, Pete, I've got nothing that's going to deal with those Shermans. I think I'm going to think I'm going to have to like retreat and just be like just running for the hills as I'm being chased by Browning fifty machine to fifty caliber <laughs> machine gun bullets, and then. The little Kate Yusha just goes, oh, you hear little faith, and just <laughs> nukes it from orbit. I was like, what just happened? <laughs> and, and, and this is the thing. You needed a six to hit. Um, it's, I think we, we figured out it was going to be a four plus for a superficial and a five yep. plus for a pen. Or it might be out by one. It might be three for a superficial, four for a pen. You get I roll. six to hit, six to penetrate. And then I'm like, it's fine. He's going to go to the vehicle damage table. 50% chance the Sherman's still good. If it's immobilized and turret jammed, it's no problem. The Katusha's between me and a whole bunch of enemies. Um, it, and, you know, the pins, I can move my officer. It's really not a big deal. Gets the six. I'm just yeah, like... Just delete. Uh, <laughs> and I, um, just, I just want everybody to know that that was a one in 218 roll. And it... <laughs> It really hurt. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. It was, it's the sort of thing where I was just like, how many points did I pay for that? Now? <laughs> and then, and then I think the, the rest of the game just felt like a Soviet horde moving towards me, me trying to do my best to not lose any units to morale and order checks. Uh, and then, and then you were going down a lot. I had to, I didn't have a choice. I just yeah. did not have a choice. Because they were on the objective, and I was like, yeah. "As long as they're alive on the objective, you can't capture them." Correct. That's all yep. that matters. You can't contest them. And even and even in the last turn, because yeah. because I was playing under the false understanding, which which I'm fine with, by the way. Like for our listeners and stuff, it's like it's not like it's not like I feel like Gorgian deliberately duped me or anything. It's fine. Um, well, we had access it, to the same information. That's right. And guess who didn't read it? The team <laughs> <laughs> didn't read the players' fair. <laughs> We didn't read it close enough. And, but, and um, actually, um, w what had happened was there, and you were like, oh, the, the object's objective in contested. And I went, look, in normal missions, it is. And, yeah. and rather than explain to you, I went, just just read it, make up your own mind. And if you yes. disagree, then we can talk about it. Then we can talk about and it. And then yeah, you yeah. read it and you just went, oh, no, you're right. It's your objective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. And, I was and like, and I, can't, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, and then I remembered to go, that's why you wanted to be defender, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, um, and, and then I think, I think we actually even just like pretended to activate the last 10 dice. Oh, out of yeah, turn five. Yeah. Cause you just went, yeah. you just went this dice and I, and you said, I don't think I can actually do anything. And then we said, okay, next yeah. dice, next dice, next dice. I, and we just, went, I did the math. I did the math in my head of, okay, how far do I need these units to go for them to be effective on getting to those? And I went, I can't flip those objectives. So yeah. that means that we're playing it for kills. And the only thing that I think I could get a kill with, so we played out a couple of those rounds, which I lost both, um, yeah. <laughs> which that's fine. Um, and then you ended up with the four point differential and got the win. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I will not, not very easily. And again, I, I appreciate you being very gentlemanly about the draw, but, but yeah. I mean, we played the mission as is. We played rules as written, and that, that's and that's how we scored it. But but looking at that mission design, I had and just the outcome of the mission, I had no business claiming the win. Like I, 
I think if if the first if I hadn't knocked out the Sherman, for example, with the multi launch, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Then, then I definitely think yeah, it was in your space. The fact that I killed one, I was starting to get a little bit cocky, going oh maybe, no, maybe yeah, I no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> yeah. but again, it was I couldn't have the Sherman in range of both objectives. They were too far apart. Yeah. My Sherman was my second Sherman was not long enough. So you would have been able to flip at least one objective, at least one of as them. the game yeah. as the game went on. But we played it to the end of turn six. We didn't get a turn seven, and we were out of time anyway. I think we only had five yes. minutes left, and yeah. we, and we said if we if we start at turn seven, even if we did get it, it would unfairly advantage the person who was more dice in the bag, which is something you have to be 100%. mindful of with your opponent. Um, and, and we looked and- at it and went, yeah, yeah, that's game. And from my point of view as well, like I don't want to start a turn knowing that I have twenty. Well, at that yeah. point I had like you know, 15. fifteen. It was fifteen to five. Dice. It was still at that fifteen. Point. Yeah, I was like, I I don't want to start a turn knowing that there's a good chance my dice are going to come out, and I could simply stall for time for the draw, or I could, um, you know, it's like I'd rather if we don't have time for the entire turn, then we simply tell the other way. Yeah, it just just keeps yeah. it clean, um, and yeah. there's no hurt feelings that way. And and I will point out maybe yeah, I did take a multi roll which I- <laughs> across I will point out that across the tournament, uh, all four rounds total cumulative I lost four auto dice across the entire weekend, and three of them were to you in that one game, <laughs> and two of them were to your multi launcher. <laughs> three. Uh, oh no, it was two because I didn't quite nuke the other squad. Yeah, I don't. I can't remember how you yeah. got the th- no. The third order dice was your S and Gs taken out by squad of six. Yeah. yeah. So just just to give you an idea of 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 how much that game affected me, uh, it was it was it was brutal. <laughs> I'm so he was glad. So traumatized. He yeah. never lost another unit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I, I lost one more because I didn't lose any in the first game, but I lost one later. Oh, okay. um, yeah, and so that, that brings us to round three. Unfortunately, you had a work emergency and you had to duck out yeah. for rounds three and four. Um, and then, so round three was Kitty Hawk down, which... Did you get hit by the plane? You know it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and again, Kitty Hawk down for a um, competitive scenario. I, I think if you're going to do that scenario competitively... You should probably not have the kill part of the the kitty hawk. I think it's it's a it's a little column A, column B, like you can, you can't. It's just that the do, you know, do you want the strategy to be playing for the objective once it finally gets on, or do you want the strategy to be everybody hanging out, playing some long range shots, and then all vomiting onto the objective at the end? And and that that's ultimately up to the TO. I think I think for me. I really like Kitty Hawk Down as a mission. I think it's super fun. Um, I, but I think in a competitive space, that one, um, I would I would not include just generally. I think you have to take too much out of what makes that mission fun to make it feel fair. Because, uh, you know, you could just be winning, demolishing your opponent, hold, controlling the entire board. The, the D6 rolls are a bit brutal. You get splattered by the plane and then you lose. And it's like, yeah. yeah, that feels really good. I had a lot of agency in that game. Um, so I played against Justin, um, who is one of the guys in Perth who has been shadow running a lot of the events for a couple of years. So you've been you've been the TO, the front man on the day, but he's the one sort of organizing them, writing players' packs, figuring out sponsors and stuff. Yeah. This is actually the first yeah. time I've played Justin because um, he moved to... He moved to Canada just as I started playing. So basically, I've been playing in uh, the events that he has built and run. And he's just... <laughs> uh, and so now he finally gets to play. And we finally get to play. And I think also the table... Um, somebody pointed this out to us later on. But so the, the table has a trench line that forms a complete U. It's an above ground earthworks trench. Then there's a trench here that goes like this and that closes the U, but it doesn't quite join it. There's a, there's gaps in the corners. And then attached to this cap is a series of like three bunker systems, again, joined by an earthwork berm. So there's like three buildings roughly in the center and there's stupid amounts of hard cover everywhere. <laughs> um, plus there's a, there's a line of sight blocking bit of tree that goes in between the center of the U. So you end up with this like snake through the center of the board where there's the only real movement. Um, 
And mm-hmm. and the way that we decided the the earth berms were is that tracked vehicles couldn't cross them. That, that's what we agreed on at the start. Yep. It that was kind sense. of like uh, it could either go it could go either way. He had a Sherman and a, and a Bren carrier, um, and I had sorry, he had a Stuart and a Bren carrier, and I had two Shermans. And so it was kind of like either way, both of us it would have benefited us for it to be open. But we just looked at it and we just went no. I think it was just a little bit too hot. But then uh, we said you couldn't run over it because it's you know earthworm track, so you have to advance into it and into it, stuff like that. And then after the game, one of the other people pointed out that the trenches weren't exactly centered. So one of you could advance from your board edge into the trench, not fully in, but you could get your bases in, and the other one couldn't, which mm-hmm. meant that you could get you basically ended up with with one person having to do three advances, and the other person having two to get over the trench. Yep. It's not a, not a huge difference, again, because the plane comes down in turn four, but it just meant that, say, for example, for my howitzer, it could be firing a turn earlier because um, I could I could run it and just touch touch the cover so it could see through it. Um, and, I, and I also think it's um, there's a slight finesse there as a player which you could potentially do something with yeah, if, yeah. if you, you know, like for my list with 20 dice, being able to get simply more men on or around mm-hmm, an objective mm-hmm. quicker does make a difference. Um, minuscule, potentially, it depends on what yeah, you need to do. Yeah. Um, I think it's just something to be mindful of something like that is just yeah. if you have these big sort of features that the snakes throughout the whole table or really cut off large parts of the table from generic movement, be... Um, yeah, just check. Mind, the di- yeah, just just double check you got your distances right. I actually helped set up a bunch of tables. And that was one of the ones that I set up, and I never thought to measure it, and I don't think I ever would have unless somebody pointed that out to me after the game. I think yeah. the, and this is also true. In, so it's true for me in round one, true for round three and round four. Be really careful as a TO to set up long unbroken structures of obstacles uncrossable terrain of any kind or something like that i know it kind of looks nice and and it sells something it looks amazing just get rid of a few pieces of fence at roughly equal distances okay it it opens up the board it opens up firing lanes it opens up maneuver lanes uh, and it feels better to play in Uh, yes there's no there's no kind of i won by terrain movement or you know controlling dominating that kind of goes away but that's kind of one of those things where it is a bit of feel bad, right? Because if if, yeah, if you don't see it, you pick the wrong side of the table, your opponent suddenly has the right terrain and all they have to do is sit in it and kill you. Like, what yep. do you do? It doesn't it doesn't feel very good. It's one, one of the worst experiences that I think um, I could ever deliver for a player when running an event is for them to have spent all the time building, testing, playing yeah. with their army list or simply just rocking it with it on the day after having painted it or anything like that. And then put it at a spot where, th- because they lost the roll off, the table is, um, I don't mind a little bit of give or take. Yeah, yeah, of course. Side, yeah. But where the table is actually so unfairly balanced that they, they really are actually put at disadvantage. Yeah. And sometimes, depending on the list that you take, you could end up disadvantaged anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, like you're but, never going to get rid of that completely. No, but but certainly for someone who I would take, you know, who takes, for example, what I, as you said earlier, like, like learn bolt action. This is a bolt action for me for sort of similar things that you would see um, in a standard reinforced platoon. For a list like that to be playing on it and go, wow, this is nothing but like a, like a minefield for my guys to yeah, turn to yeah. because I can't, I've got nothing that protects me from HE. For yeah, example. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, no, I mean, no, no. You don't really yeah, yeah, protect yeah, yeah. from HE, you just don't. You try to stay out of line of sight of AG, but um, but if you don't have anything that blocks on the side on your side of the table, what do you do? You you can't. You just have to run. No, no hard cover, no line of sight. Yeah. So just yep. just some things to keep in mind. Um, I will also add that the, that the quality of the terrain at, at the Albany at Southern Trust was insane. It was it was yep. leaps and bounds above what we've seen in Perth. We've talked about how good it is in Perth, but I think the just the average quality was 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 just really top notch. Um, so the tables were beautiful. Some of them from a gameplay perspective were, um, it could, could have, could have done with some work. 
Um, the I mean, credit where credit is due, right? This um, Gilly's first attempt at trying yeah. to pull one of these together. So I, and I he did a phenomenal was, job. Yeah. I th- well, I think his first setups were better than my first oh, setups yes. when I. So, and, <laughs> and so I'm just like, from my point of view, I'm like, these are amazing. Yeah, <laughs> they, they are. They are. And I think it's it. And, and full disclosure, Gilly asked um, us both. He's like, when you guys do your event recap, don't don't pull punches. Anything that you see is a flaw, let us know and and be honest about it. I can take criticism. Um, and and these are all things I have already uh, spoken to Gilly about, so it won't be news to him either. Um, so anyway, so this game against Justin Kitty Hawk down first wave um, standard. I think his list was a squad of commandos, a squad of chindits, um, Bren Carrier, Stewart. First Lieutenant yeah. Sniper and a Howitzer. I think they're my and a Naval Observer. Let's not forget the Naval Observer. Uh, and so he, you know, we, we played the game of of, uh, of first wave, and I I just moved like a, I got one squad fire on my right flank. I got one squad fire on my left flank. My two squads of sixes in the middle, and my two Shermans. And this is it was actually something I said out loud to to Justin because I was like. If I go outside the trench system, it's going to be, we said it was line of sight blocking. So I was like, okay, I can't shoot into it. So the, all you have to do is cross the trench and you're safe, which you can do from your deployment because I didn't know that he needed an extra movement, but it, it wasn't going to make a difference. Um, okay, so what does a big flanking maneuver look like? If I think you're going to sit in your trench line, how do I how do I defeat that? I go long way around. And I was like, the table's 48 long. That's two turns of running, and then I've just made it to your deployment zone, at which point I've massively telegraphed what I'm doing, and you know it's coming, and all you have to do is advance out from basically the center of your trench to the (laughs) other side of your trench, and you're still going to be in hard cover, and and I'm burned. So, and then I was like, Kitty Hawk is going to come roughly center, right? It's it's a sum of 10d6, so it averages out to be near the center of the board, um, just because of the law of averages. Um... And, and then I'm like, oh, I, have to, I just have to move my Shermans to the middle. I don't have a choice. I have to risk it because if I go anywhere else, they're not going to do anything. And my list just falls apart without the Shermans, right? It's the list is purely, um, Shermans kill stuff that kills infantry, infantry kill stuff that kills Shermans. That's the list, right? I, I need them to work together. So we end up in this thing where both my Shermans make this little convoy around the middle and everything's still in hard cover. So I'm just plinking away with MGs trying to put a pin out. Um, Howard, sir, top of turn two, gets the six on the sniper. Kills, really? the, kills the loader, doesn't doesn't force the... Uh, it passes the morale check. Um, and then uh, you, I do some movements around here. His naval observer comes in or he, he he declares the target basically center of the board and it's a building so rather than it being you know the dot it's the <laughs> it's like this big. and i'm like i can't do anything about that <laughs> except run uh, there was a, a literally he targeted the building and a couple of my squads just went <laughs> just yeah. went out of there but I, I was like my shamans have activated like i just wear this um and uh uh yeah and then you know that that sort of rolls over we're doing you know he's trying to get some indirects on me nothing's really happening um with his uh uh, and then round two is a bit more of that. Um, round three is, th- this is just when it all goes crazy. So the, uh, I think his, his uh, observer, oh no, he couldn't, he couldn't call it in round one. So he calls it in round two because he had to advance on. So he called it in round advance two um, and it gets delayed. So it doesn't come in round three. Ooh, okay. uh, and so I'm like, I just got to keep going. Like I can't, I can't hide from, cause he's put the yeah, observer yeah. in the center of the board. I can't hide from it. Right. Because no. then all he's going to do is going to push me back. He's going to be on the objective. Then I have to fight for the objective. My chance is to stop him from getting to the objective. If I have to sacrifice yeah. a Sherman or two to do it, I have no choice. So I yeah. said to myself, um, so, <laughs> so, and then, um, so turn three, my, he fires his sniper. Um, okay. and, okay. and so then my howitzer just deletes it. Fine. Um, so that that's that's the first unit for me there because it's zeroed in, right? It's it's one guy. He's fired. Even if he goes down, it doesn't matter. I just delete the sniper anyway. So I take that order dice. 
Um, and and basically, I'm moving one twelve man squad through the trench line on the far left, and the other one is on the far right, snaking through. He's plinking at me with brain carriers and rifles from his naval observer, and he's like killing one or two every time. And I'm in hard cover at range, and sometimes he's moving. I'm like, come on, man! <laughs> and and so they're they're making their way across, uh, and my shamans are moving through again, just machine guns. Everything's in hard cover or small team at this point, and then. We got around four, and his naval observer comes in, and the plane comes in, all, all at the same time. Oh no! Uh, and and so his <laughs> naval comes in, and it scatters. Uh, it scatters towards his lines. It okay. it puts three pins on Crazy Train, which is near on the center of the board, and it puts uh, one pin on Lady Luck, which is my other Sherman, and he puts a pin on his Chindit squad. That's his naval observer done. I was like, oh okay. wow, safest houses. And then we roll Kitty Hawk down and it just lands like two inches next to Crazy Train. Uh, and then, of course, we do all the rolls. Crazy Train, because it says it takes a medium howitzer hit, not a strength three hit. And so we read that to mean you go through the whole thing. Pins, wounds, the whole thing. And we said it's indirect. It's a plane crashing on top of you. It's going to hit your roof. So he gets the three pins. Uh, then he fails to penetrate. And so now, yes. now he's, yes. it gets better. Now it's on six pins. Um, oh, his steward came around and, and bounced a bounce around off Lady Luck, and and I missed returning fire. So his steward is now facing off against two Shermans, and and it's all very crazy. Crazy trains <laughs> on on six pins, uh, and then uh, fails to penetrate. Nothing. Just bounces the Kitty Hawk down off the roof. A couple more pins on Lady Luck. Uh, a couple of other squads get pinned, and so now I'm just like. All right, objectives on. I'm just vomiting all of my good dudes up to the thing. Uh, first dice of turn four is my howitzer. I go for his chindit squad. Gets a six right over the top. Great, there we go. <laughs> deletes, and he's like, I'm not going to go down. Like, why would I ever go down? Um, deletes uh... <laughs> deletes the chindit squads, gets the three pins. He gets morale check, fails. Goodbye, chindits. So now he's only got a commando squad, his naval observer, his officer, and his howitzer, and a steward, and a brain carrier. He's still got seven dice. Um, it's, but it, yeah. it's looking pretty it's dicey. seven dice, but it's a shaky seven. Yep. Yeah, it's looking pretty dicey. Uh, and then um, he activates his steward, shoots Crazy Train, hits it, round bounces off the front of it. Crazy Train, seven pins in the center of the board. By other Lady Luck activates, put a round right through the steward, pops it. Massive damage. See you later. Uh, medium gun against the light tank front armor. No arguments there. Uh, and then, yeah, all of my squads move on and I start dishing out some pins. Um, last dice. Rally crazy train. Gets the rally. Roll the six for pins. It's now a good to go Sherman in the center of the board. Oh, no. And then, <laughs> uh, you know, my officer was there. And then it just basically came. Like, I just had two Shermans in front of the objective, all four squads, and my officer on the objective. And yeah. His squad would come out comes, and get gunned down. And you just and you just wipe it out. Yeah. 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 And and so that was the, the round three. And of course two. from just and from Justin's point of view, he's like, I mean, I'm committed, right? Like it's it's that's the objective and yeah, it's, yeah. I know I c I I'm down on kills. It's sort of I have to you know Yeah. Yeah. Uh <laughs> oh, no. I had some super hot dice that round though. Like Credit where credit is. Oh, true. good. Uh, I felt really that's bad for Justin. Our dice went. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. The regression to the mean was between rounds three, two, and three. I tell you what, um, because you needed a night's sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Recharge my dice. <laughs> Put them back in the. <laughs> uh, and, and it was funny because Justin was like, "I got gorged." I was like, "What do you mean?" He's just like, "There's a reason it rhymes with torture." <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but no, he had a good chat about it. And he's just like, honestly, you played the most Gorchin game that there is. You told everybody what you were taking. You said you take four squads, you take four squads. You, yep. If you have tanks, you use them in concert. And that's what you did. You pick a point, you drive home, use your artillery to take out units. You just played how you say that you play on your podcast. And I lost. And I have just as much information to beat you as everybody else did. <laughs> he's like, Including you won that. a naval gun. <laughs> and he's like, you won that fair and square. I was like, okay. Yeah. I mean, there was a bit of luck with the Naval Observer um, and, of course, getting the multiple indirect hits on sixes. Uh, yeah. But I think, yeah, it, it, it was a little bit uh, on the balance in between in the middle there. Um, could have gone either way for sure. 
but we'll... I, I think there's a lot to be said as well for like you say you know you you talk about the way that you like to play you talk about how you build your list and, and your list reviews of when you put those up on our facebook groups and and why you take those certain choices that you plan to run. Like, it's not like you have a hidden playbook. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I, I shared my list with, um, with like you guys on the podcast group. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, because I wanted you to get a bit of a kick out of what was going because only, only me and Gorgian went. So Jacob and yeah, Tyler yeah. went there. Um, and, and so I was like, I wanted you guys to get a bit of a kick out of what I was going to do um, and torture myself over the, uh, over the two days playing 20 dice list um, for four games in a row. Um, but I didn't actually really tell anyone else until the day before when yeah. the list went live. And that's when everyone was like, you're bringing what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think this was the one event where I didn't do a list write-up because the lists were going yeah. live. I was like, they're all going live, they're going public. I think it was actually a week before the event. I think it was... It was a full week, yeah. Yeah, I think it might have been six days or something. Must have been a week, yeah. yeah. With, the, with the submissions and stuff like that. But I was like, look, they're up. I think I was like one of two US players... Uh, and I took Bloody Gulch and I called my list Hello Second Armored. Like, if that doesn't scream, it it's me. Clear. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's gorgeous. So I was like, if you want to know how, like, why I took it, I'll, I'll let you know, but I won't bore everybody with it with a post. Yeah. Um, so then shaping up, who did you fight in round four? Round four was Chris. So I was up against Soviets again. Um, and <laughs> look, again. Um, this is, this is, I looked at his list and I was pretty worried. Um, he had two M3 scout cars as transports, two Bren carriers, um, yeah. which were transports as well. And he had two of the BA6 armored cars with the LMGs. And I think they were enclosed as well on his list. He had a Ziz 3 and an officer, one squad, one half track had a squad of six with a flamethrower, or a squad of eight with a flamethrower, and the other squad of eight. I think it was just guys with rifles in the end. Um, I can't really remember. But he was playing a, a reconnaissance platoon, a mounted reconnaissance platoon. So as the game starts, he gets a free 12 inch move. But just, just before we get to that, this is another one of those 24 by 24 obstacle boxes. Um, and uh, when we talked about the terrain, uh, I had the side that had the 24 by 24 box. So it means none of his wheeled vehicles could cross it because they can't cross obstacles. And I had two gates. Uh, and they were in my deployment zone. One was like four inches from my board edge. The other one was two inches from my board edge. Uh, and I just put my demolition base in the center of that 24 by 24 box. Uh, and my showmans had to yep. go on reserve. And I was like, I just have to buy one turn. There's, there's, no, yeah. way that he, there's no way that he does this. Uh, and then there was, there was a couple of, there was a couple of things that really made the game. The first one was, I used the bait unit, so you're welcome, Jackson. I finally bowed. Thank you to your advice. I finally used the bait unit. Uh, actually, it wasn't the first game, but this was one of those ones where, like, in the game against you, we both knew it was a bait unit. It was a it was a squad of yes. six on a flank. But this was a squad of twelve, um, right up <laughs> outside outside my little death box, at basically what was almost out in the open to one. They're up against the wall behind a building. My original plan with them was. If he takes the bait, fine. They'll just go down and they'll wear hits. And once he forgets about them, I'm going to take out the Ziz 3 that's holding the main road and I'll just punch a Sherman up the main road into his base and call it a day. Um, that was kind of plan A. Oh, sorry, that was plan B. If, if he doesn't take the bait and he lets it slide, I'll swing that unit, take out the Ziz 3, and, yeah. and either run the unit or, or swing a Sherman up there and take it out. Uh, but plan A was that, was that he takes the bait and he spends a lot of resources killing the unit. And then, uh, yeah, so he put basically a Bren carrier, a transport, and a BA-6 on this flank, and another one on this flank, and we had sort of a box of roads that, that boxed out my, my little kill box. And I just put all of my infantry in some trees and, and some stuff around my demolition base. So the idea was I would just pivot left or right, depending on which yep. one needed a flank, and then a big bait unit out there. And so um, I had my howitzer holding the left street, uh, and basically, the idea was, if I get an early activation, I'll sling it at his transport. Maybe I, you know, maybe I pop it, maybe I don't, but it'll be a nice one. Of course, I don't get the first activation. His, his transport rolls up, um, shoots at my house, or I go down because I don't want to give up. I don't need it to do stuff. I just need it to not give up the dice. So I just go down. Yes. Uh, and then, but he gets a free 12-inch move at the start of the game with all transports. 
And the way that the, the rule is written, and I did actually double check this, the way that the rule is written is that it's all transports. So the Bren carriers get a 12 inch move. So he moves, moves one up and, and you shoot him a howitzer and stuff. And, and, and I got a squad of 12 that are in hard cover about 11 inches away from a Bren carrier with a squad of five in it. And I'm sitting there like, and I get this dice. I'm like, my howitzer's is down. I don't want to go down with my Shermans because I'm just giving up tempo. Um, my other squad hasn't been shot at yet, but I think I'm going to need them to go down because there's like six machine guns pointed at them and they're just hanging out at the moment. And so I'm like, I'm going to charge a brain carry with my squad. And he's like, you can charge a transport? And I was like, yeah, of course. And he's like, well, what happens? And I was like, well, you can declare to react. Or you can shoot with the transport if you want, just like normal. Um... But then I had to double check. I wasn't quite sure the, the sequence, but you shoot it, I charge. Uh, instead of fighting the transport, I fight the guys inside the transport. Uh, and you then, know, choice jumps out. Yeah. Uh, I, I, think oh, right. it's, I think it's largest. And then if it's equal, then it's- Largest you, or unit you know, of choice, yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and so he was like, oh, I'm going to recce. And I was like, time out. <laughs> you, you get transport yeah. or recce. <laughs> yeah. You don't oh, get wow. that. <laughs> and then he was like, okay, I'll take the shot. And then he's like, I'll wait till you're six inches. And I was like, time out. Uh, reacting to a charge is not the same as an ambush. Reacting to a charge, you shoot at first opportunity when the charge is declared, yeah. not um, at whatever distance you like. So, hilariously, he still kills three guys and exceptionals the NCO. Well <laughs> done, Chris. Scott of, like, that's regulars in hard cover. Um, Gorgon's like, are you serious? What is this? Like yeah. And so, anyways, I, I, I'll go the charge. It's eight versus five. I win the fight. Is yeah. transport's activated. Um, that's two dice in hand. Yeah, and I was like, turn auto pop. And I was like, okay, that's not too bad. Um, that scared him. And and he said it. He's like, that put the fear of God in me. So this other squad of 12, he did not get anywhere near them. He moved his brain oh. carrier away from them. And then his M3 scout car and his BA6, he just sat yeah. there and shot at them at range. Yeah. And because of the way the alley was and, and, uh, and the angle, they were in hard cover. So I just kept going down. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and he just sat there. You're, play, you're playing the waiting game. Yeah, as I said, if you, if you want to take the... I need to wait till my Shermans rock up. That's all I need to do. Um, and so his other transport rocks up. These guys cop out um, and they take some shots. I try to kill my officer. Officer goes down. Again, I don't need him to do anything. I actually move my officer first and put a pin on the, on the transport just in case. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and then... Um, yeah, I snapped two with him and I moved one of the other infantry squads, put two pins in the transport just to try to slow everything down. And then, you know, we, we get to um, round two. Uh, he, you know, he's got this this transport on two pins. Um, the squad hops out. They take some shots. Um, I move I move out with, with my two squads. I clean that up. His a squad mm -hmm. of engineers comes out from his half track and tr basically tries to chase me this way. Um, yep. but then my Sherman rolls on and immobilizes the BA six doesn't kill it, just immobilizes it. Ooh. And so now it's hanging yeah. out in the open and, and so that Sherman's just hanging out there. And this whole left flank is now secure. There is a transport on three pins and immobilized BA six and that's it. And there's a squad of infantry centered. This other squad here on the right, I just, just kept going down. They're on like six pins. Uh, and I just, I just like. I'll grab the dice at the end of the turn just in case like, they don't get shot at and I get to rally them. His Ziz 3 is trying to direct fire them as well. I don't know why he's not going indirect. I think he only he only elected to go indirect, I think, at turn 6 or turn 5. Oh, uh, so he was trying to get the direct shot off. Thinking yeah. Thinking it might have been better than the indirect working down. I mean, sometimes it is a toss-up. Um, but yeah. typically, if especially if they're in hard cover and stuff, just indirect. Well, just they, they were already down when he started shooting with the Ziz 3. So yeah. I would have expected him to go for the indirect first. Indirect but, first. Um, yeah, did, didn't get there to the end. Uh, then his, he finally realizes that squad's not a threat. So he zips his brain carry down to the, to the gate. Now it's turn three. My second Sherman rolls on because it failed in the first auto test. I just park it in front of the brain carry and point blank it. He changes Pretty his... Nice. Put a nice hole in it. Um. Yeah. And so now there's a dead brain carrier blocking the gate on my right side. And there's a dead transport. Mm. The transport got removed and there's a BA6 who's now dead on the left flank who's choking the, the gate a little bit on the left. So I just ran my howitzer on the gate. Um, and 
And then, uh, so he had sort of these two cars in the middle and a squad of engineers. He changed his mind and went in different direction with the squad of engineers. And they end up out in the open and I just shot them with everything I had. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then. Because biggest threat, target priority. Pretty much. I, the, and then the other two transports, yeah, they had, you know, there was a transport in the army car. Yeah, they had a whole bunch of bristling with MGs and stuff, but it was like, I'm not too fast. I'll just go down. And and then Crazy Train just rolls up and it's just putting, trying to put rounds through transports and, and armored cars. And then that was that was the, that was game six, really. Uh, neither of our demolition bases were, were touched. Um, yep. And I think it was, well, I can't remember. I think it was five or six kill points to zero or something like this. Might have been a couple yeah. more. Um, uh, yeah, I managed to not give up any 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 order dice. Oh, sorry, no, I did give up the one. He did get through that squad of twelve in the end. Oh um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it took that long. It, it took about four turns, uh, four or five turns of 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 at three or four machine guns shooting at them every turn because it got to the point where there was there was I think there was four guys left and they were on seven pins, um, and and he basically just point blanked them and they were down, but it was still twos at this point, so. And he kills two of them. They take an order test on eight pins or seven pins. I'm just like, yeah, they're, they're going to fail this. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's like, I, I'm doing this in case they pass and can run away, but really it's so they go down. <laughs> you know, the, the, yeah, the morale check that they, yeah, they, they failed the morale check. They were oh, down. the morale piece. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, yes. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, it was, it was a, it was an empty transport with two machine gunners and a BA6 armored car as this three and an LT was all that was left on the board. I'm I'm curious. Was he running the so so with the reconnaissance units? You can leave guys behind yeah. in the transport and to count as crew to manage the extra guns. Was he running them then as uh, manned transport? No, we clarified that at the start. Yeah, good. Because 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 there's the there's the U.S. armored infantry platoons that, mm -hmm. but that's actually a theater selector special rule where if you yeah. buy the half track, they don't, and you leave guys behind, they don't count as empty transports, but Correct. his, the, the rule is on the, the mounted recon squad. And it says yes. it can fire additional one additional weapon per guy left behind than yeah. an empty transport. Yes. So it's an empty it's, transport that can fire more guns, yet. not a man transport. That was yeah. something, but it it actually didn't matter anyway because they were he always had an, an armored car within an inch of his transport. Yeah, uh, yeah. Good. So he was basically running them as as twinned armored cars. Yeah, which is actually a really clever idea. I really liked it. Oh, it's good. But no, it, it's really really good. It meant that I had to kill his BA six to pop his transport. Yes. And and he was like, "Oh, why don't you just shoot the transport? It's easier to kill with my Sherman." I was like, "Yeah, but if I kill the BA six, I get two for one." <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yep. and, and so, then and then and that's probably when he was like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, fr frustrating game for for Chris, I think. Just again, that was one of those things where, look, the terrain didn't decide the game, but it certainly made it a lot easier for me by yeah. by a huge margin, yeah. especially because, you know, I took out. His two, well, I took out one of his track vehicles, and then his second one he should have just plowed through one of the fences. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think that's that's one of those things where if if something catches you unawares, like me charging his transport, and that really like rocks you, you gotta get back in the game super quick. Um, yeah, you, you gotta you gotta find find a a crutch or a mental strategy or something like that. Just be like, oh my god, I didn't know you could do that. That's that's horrifying. This other this other um, brain carrier just had an officer in it, and his other transport had eight guys in it, and I had a squad of twelve. Like I'm not charging a squad of twelve against eight. Like just I'm not doing. No, that. it's a lot of dice here. It's, it's a lot of dice here against yeah. the captain. Yeah, maybe. Probably, yeah, 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 yeah. I was in range, but but the eight is a lot more a lot more risky. Yeah, um, and especially because I had to cross a lot of ground to make that happen. Like he had to get yeah. closer to, for that to risk it. And, you know, the, at that point, the, the unit was on six pins. I think it was one turn three. It was on six pins. I was like, you're, you're out of time, Chris. Like, you got to go. But, of course, I wasn't going to tell him. <laughs> oh, no. Look, yeah. And, and look, th there's, there's this crossover between um, being able to have uh, – got to be able to have a competitive game without it being a learning game. Yeah, yeah, but there yeah. are also times where you've got to be able to have a learning game where it's more competitive, and yeah. then there are the times where you need to be able to have a competitive game while still being a learning game. Yeah, yeah. Um, but those, those they don't always go together, and yeah. player we're, we're pretty good in Perth. Um, like a lot of the, 
a lot of the casual games that we that, that I pick up, for example, and and people who are wanting to get back involved or wanting to catch up games for bolt action, and I'm like, is is there anything that you want yeah, to yeah, do or yeah. try different that I can that I can because I've got quite a lot of resources, so I can bring something that's different for you to play against. Um, in fact, I did that with Chris when he was yeah. trying to understand how to use cavalry. And I was yeah, like, well, yeah, bring yeah. a Japanese lift that's different. And whilst he still beat me with that list. Um, when he first looked at it, he was like, "This list is terrifying. I don't know how I'm going to find yeah, it." Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm like, "That's that's what I want to be able to create because you'll learn through the experiences." And so, um, I, I think a lot of people over that weekend learn a lot of things um, about, <laughs> you know, and me included. Where I'm just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't enjoy twenty dice lists. No, having but to play them. credit to you, you got to the end of turn five in both of your games, and that really <laughs> goes to show you that yep. that bolt action is a fast system. Like, it yes, a big yeah. part of that is is on the player as well to play fast, but mm -hmm. the top speed limit in is not in the system. It's it's on the player. No. There are other games yeah, where it is the system. Um, mm. the, yeah, the top speed limiter on, on bolt action really comes down to the player. As as unfortunate that is to say, um, but as particularly in, you know, if you're not having beer and pretzels you're not catching up with a buddy and that sort of thing which are fantastic to do over a game of bolt action don't get me wrong um but you know if you're at a tournament and you're going how am i going to get through six turns in two hours and it's like my friend it can absolutely be done it's in there it's just about making yeah. those those snap decisions and and thinking quickly and trying to think those one or two steps ahead but yeah look it was honestly i was really gassed coming coming through the weekend i think um, Saturday night when we all went to this is the other thing I love about the Perth community is that is that the TO invited everybody to his house for a barbecue after after or between rounds two and three because it was a, an overnight and, pause and catered for it and like, catered substantially <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah nobody went hungry but honestly uh, it was just like all of the players just sat down and the TOs were just like beer in hand amazing food it, it, like on our plates and then it's just like yeah, big big thanks to Nina and John for yeah. that yeah, absolutely. And and all of us are just like, bolt action's fun. I'm so tired. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, he, yeah. Pete said to me afterwards, because he, he came and crashed with us when yeah. we all um, sort of were sitting around and chatting and having a good ball and stuff. And on the drive back home to Al um, to Naranga up from, um, yeah. from Albany, he was like, you guys went pretty hard at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think... I think if I if I if we do that again, I'm going to need a lot more caffeine if, if we're going to go for beers on that first night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think we'll definitely have some opportunity to um to do lots of different things. Um, yeah, coming forward. Um, oh, Gorgon, I haven't even talked about the plane. Oh, yeah. Oh my god, oh. you haven't even talked about the plane. So so, so yeah. Dan, so like. <laughs> I, I was there pretty early helping set up tables and everybody just sort of rolled in, you know, an hour and a half, an hour early. And then, and I think you were one of the last in, Dan. And like, yeah. oh my God, when you walked in, I, I was like, somebody get that man a bucket. Like, Dan, are you all right? How bad was the drive? <laughs> I don't think I've, I've ever seen everybody. you that pale. No, I don't think any of you have seen me that pale before. And I was pale to begin with. So that's saying <laughs> something. Um, so essentially what had happened, and, and this, you know, it, Pete and I joke about it, so it's fine, it's, it's, it's all good. But um, so my father-in-law, where he is in the property and his background and what he does is involved in engineering bits and pieces, and he has an ultralight plane. And he's like, oh, we need to go pick up some fuel from the generator, so we got to go do that. And uh, oh, we'll, I'll take you up and, and we'll do a little trip in the plane. Amazing. What a way and to as, start as the day. We, yeah, and, and look, look, to be brutally honest, I knew what I was getting myself into because I've been in that plane before yeah, yeah. Um, and I was I knew it was a bit windy and I was watching the, the windsock and stuff and I was like, well, look, what's the worst? I've been on planes before. What's the worst it can be? And we're, we're getting ready for takeoff and, and Pete's looking at the windsock and he's like, yeah, look, it's a, it's a bit, it looks a bit windy and stuff. Look, if I'm not, if I'm not comfortable with it, I just won't take off and then, you know, we'll just get in the car. It'll be fine. And, and I was like, I trust you. I got no reason not to trust you. You're a qualified pilot, uh, <laughs> and, so and ultimately he's in the plane with you, right? Like that's right, that's right. Um, and uh, and this this thing is, um, if you think about, uh, and this is 
I'm going to do horrible justice to this, but if you take a Coke can, cut the sides open and splay the wings out, that's about what it was. Uh, and what so was now it? take that. Is, is a Cessna not an ultralight? Oh, it's smaller than a Cessna oh, and much wow. lighter than a okay. Cessna. Okay. Yeah. Um, this, this is a kit built aircraft. A, right. Yeah. A legal, yeah. Yeah. Legal yeah. kit built yeah. aircraft, but it's, um, yeah, it's all, all essentially. Ikea built. for aircraft. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And so imagine this little Coke can and you put a turbo a turbo fan in front of it and just throw that can at it and see what happens. Um, it, it was as he got up and as we started flying, um, um, Pete was like, he looked over at me and he's like, yeah, it's a, it's a bit rougher than I thought. <laughs> um, and, and that's when I started going, okay. <laughs> but we were in the air. I was committed. Um, and I went, and he pointed off it to something in the distance and he was just like, look, we're just going over there. We should be all right. I'll go a little bit higher. It might be a bit rumpy on, bumpy on the way back. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. If you need more time, we'll just take more time. And I'm like, yep, that's fine. And on the way over, like the first um, bit of the flight, I was like, I'm a little bit bumpy, but it's actually not that bad. And then as we climbed a bit in attitude, the wind speed dies down and gets a lot smoother because you yeah, don't yeah, have the yeah. ground that it's rolling over. And that was much better. <clears throat> and so on the way over, I was like, we landed, um, you know, sort of to walked around for a little bit. I was like, yeah, I feel a little bit seedy, but I'm okay. And then it was time to go. And I was like, yep, okay. Then we get in the plane and Pete's like, now I'm going to have to, because over there there's a power line that crosses and crosses here. And so when, when I go up, I might have to bank steeply to, because I can't, if I don't get enough height, if we're not going fast enough, I won't get high enough. And so I'm going to have to come around. Um, and so I was like, oh, yep, look, again, I trust you. <laughs> um, it's fine. And uh, the actual, the banking turn wasn't a problem, but then the Coke can was doing much more of this uh, <laughs> on the way. <laughs> and, and look, at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it, it was great. I was fine, but um, you should have seen me getting out of the plane and when I was in the plane. I was, the plane is like a lime green and I'm pretty sure I was competing for the brightest color in the plane. <laughs> um, it was, um, I think, you know, Pete was kind of like, I wouldn't, if I'd known what that was going to be like, I probably wouldn't have suggested we go up. Like, <laughs> if it was him himself, he probably would have flown it because he does it all the yeah, time. Yeah, he loves yeah. flying. But he's like, I probably wouldn't have taken a passenger. <laughs> um, and, and all of that was then, as we came in to land the plane, we're going in and there's this big, in the runway that we're coming in on, on his property. Yeah. And the, the runway only needs to be like um, sort of 500 metres less yeah, there yeah, yeah. because it's, it's really easy to slow down. Like, blows your mind how easy it is to slow that thing down and anyway we're coming in and there's this big tree so the wind is coming off the yeah. tree and doing rollies and so we come into land and he's he's like okay we're coming in we're landing we've stopped flying we're just going to touch down now and roll through and then the plane's doing this <laughs> it just gets so picked we're, up we're coming by the in wind. and then, and then the, the wind comes in from the tree and just goes whoop and then so pete's then had to react and um you know get us back down on the ground and stuff and uh you know he's he's um we walk back over to where the mum in law is and she's like, I think that's the worst landing I've ever seen him attempt. And I'm just like, great. <laughs> Any so landing that you walk got... away is from is a good landing. <laughs> so, so needless, yes. And we did, we made that exact comment. But uh, but so by the time that I actually got to um, the event um, and if I already looked sick, just imagine how bad it was. <laughs> the hour beforehand where I was coming down off the shock and the anxiety and the, and all the, the, the seediness I'm alive. that I was feeling. I'm alive. <laughs> the, the, and the, and the, and the drive and the drive that then went in for, which was at about an hour and a half. So, um, yes, look, plane trip before an event, if it's somewhere like Las Vegas and you're in a big turbo jet where the turbulence is not so bad, um, it's fine. I can say that I've experienced real turbulence, um, <laughs> Not many people, what they think is turbulence is kind of not real turbulence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I've i been in a Cessna and, and yeah. that's like, even on a nice clear day, you're just like, oh boy. Uh, yeah. If, if, yeah. Like I, I'm not, I'm not one to get jittery in turbulence or something like that. It doesn't, doesn't bother me as much as some, some other people. Um, so I was pretty chill in the Cessna ride, but, but it's just one of those things. Like you just notice it. You're just like, right. Okay. This is. This is what flying is like when you don't have thousands of thousands of tons or hundreds of. I have actually have no idea how much a a, a seven four seven or equivalent weighs. You have a lot of plane to buffer a the lot of planes. <laughs> Whatever metric is appropriate for that amount of plane, yeah, 
when you when you get to something like a Cessna, you're just like, huh, okay, interesting. Yeah, um, yep, yeah, it's and yeah, and uh, but no, it was it was it was all still enjoyable and all still good. But um, well, I think that's um that's probably everything that we need to cover off. Obviously, you've got your chat with Gilly, which we recorded. Um, yeah, yeah, coming which soon. Recorded, which will come soon. Yep. Soon, TM. So that's well worth the listen. Yeah. Um, and I'll then, probably uh, put that up before this one. So if, you, if you've if okay. you made it all the way through this and you have no idea what the TO had to say about his own event, first off, shame on you. Second, go check out that video. Yeah, absolutely. Um, awesome guy. Can't wait for the next one. And and can't, you know, stoked that the um, the standard of what we are able to take part in um, is actually really good, not just in Perth, but also with our, within our buddies the, down in Albany. The, within the state now, yeah. Yeah, this is the... Uh, first non-Perth event, and and Gilly said it looks like he's going to try and repeat this every year. So fantastic. Yeah. It really seems like the bolt-action scene here in WA is really gaining some traction. I had, um, I've got my event, Band of Brothers, is a team event coming yes. up in, in about 10 days, and I actually just, just did the final count of, of players. So I've got 24 confirmed, which is fantastic. That's um, awesome. I absolutely cannot ask for more. There are two teams of three that dropped out, and there are another two teams of three that couldn't make it for other circumstances. So oh, wow. all that being said, uh, I, I mean, I appreciate I'm kind of cherry picking the numbers here a little bit, but there was a 36 player pool for the event at one point. Never quite confirmed 36. It's not like we hit 36 and then bounced off of it, but we were, yeah, we were looking at 36 players for the event. And that's also with yourself that's out not even so that yeah. would have been 37 plus a few more yeah. people it might have been 39 if if we can that's at that point we're really starting to fudge numbers going to 39 but the 36 but was was that, the potential player pool that's fantastic because because we have about um uh, give give or take or any event yeah. or people running forward um we have about about 35 to 45 people that are actively engaged in the community yeah. regularly in the front you know, that try to get to the events that so that would have been Almost everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and also to consider that happened two weeks after the Albany event as well. There have yeah. been a few previous incidences where we've had some stuff a little bit too close and yep. people have claimed that they couldn't get the leave passes uh, and they were getting some, some tournament fatigue. But yeah. Yeah. So to get, you know, as I said, 24 people confirmed, confirmed is awesome though. It's fantastic. So I'm really hoping that uh, we can break the the drafting and the team format as much as we can, so I can bring everybody something fresh, new, and exciting next year. Because mm. um, I think I think if we uh, naturally we'll we'll keep Justin and, and Outpost and yourself. We're going to keep running Skulls uh, for the foreseeable future. I don't see that changing. Then we'll have um, Southern Thrust, which is the Albany event, and then we'll have Band of Brothers as well. So it's going to be at least four events a year in WA, including any other ones that happen. So I was going to say, cause there's, then there's all the, like, like the typically non-event things yeah. that also go on. So like we've got the combined arms campaign that'll be kicking yeah. off in, yeah. in a couple of weeks. Um, and I still have plenty of ideas for events that, uh, uh, yeah, that's not going to slow. Yeah. Look, my, my dream is to get one a month on the calendar. Um, yeah. that whether or not we have the critical mass to support that and people are going to get event fatigue is a separate question, but us, one, one a quarter is better than, than one a half. I will absolutely take that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for anyone that wants to get in touch with us, um, we'll have our social interactions linked in the description uh, below. Um, you can catch this on obviously our Western tabletop channel or any of our other podcast recordings that we've got on Google Podcasts. And, uh, Every and podcasting Podbean. platform. Think everything, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. As everyone that that's people have suggested us, we're, we're on. Yeah. Um, we do potentially, like sometimes we need to re-upload something. If it doesn't sync, just let us know. We jump on those as quick as we can. Um, but otherwise, um, this has been of all. Uh, I'm looking forward to all the new wonderful things that are coming forward. I've been Dan. I've been Gorchin. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Ciao.